Buongiorno. Buongiorno a tutti, inviterei tutti i presenti a prendere comodamente posto in sala. Perché... Good morning everyone, I would invite you to sit down because we're beginning with the third session of our second day of this conference uh, on Claudio Abado's work and this is going to be a rather uh, busy day like yesterday and uh, you will have the chance of uh, uh, listening to the various topics that are going to be dealt with are definitely uh, connected to each other and connected to some of the themes that have been discussed yesterday. After having spoken uh, about uh, Maestro Abado and his relationship with music, after having spoken about other aspects uh, connected to the new Abado, uh, we start from another topic, that of space. And this is a theme that has to be understood in a polysemic way. Space is not just the space where a sound uh, reverberates. Uh, space is also and means also an interpersonal space, the space which is being created between those who have to build up sound, a conductor, and all the rest of the orchestra members. Space is the space in the hall. Space is sound and the position of sounds, as Mr. Stoppa is going to be discussing. But let's start uh, uh, talking about space with the first speaker, Mrs. Eva Maria Tomasi. Uh, she'll be talking about an interpersonal space. Differently from yesterday, I would prefer uh, to have questions taken right after each single presentation so that we can get a, an immediate feedback with uh, the uh, speaker at the very end of the presentation. If there are no questions, of course, we can continue. After the first uh, couple of presentations, uh, we will have a video presentation by Ciela Aguillaro, and then we will have a short pose and we'll resume later. So the first two presentations are about uh, how to create interpersonal spaces and the building of a space within the orchestra. Um, and this is going to be dealt with by Mr. Porrani. And then we shall expand on the concept of space as a venue, as a physical space. To you, the floor. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for the invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. I'm here as a member of the Berlina Philharmonica, and Claudio Abado was the principal conductor for 12 years. And uh, um, I'd like to grasp this opportunity to tell you about this fantastic period that we have spent with him the election of the principal director of the Berlina Philharmonica uh, took place in October 1989. And in December the same year, Claudio Abado conducted his first concert uh, in his position, which was confirmed. In that period, exactly on November the 9th, 1989, uh, the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, the wall which divided this city for 28 years. You may imagine that with this date, a new era began. Um, I was appointed a violinist of the Berliner Philharmonica in the spring in 1990. At the same time, there was a generational change in the orchestra, and approximately one-third of musicians uh, were retired and were replaced by young people. I say this because it wasn't just the fate, uh, but uh, uh, this was perfectly adjusted to Mr. Abado's personality. Um, he never wanted to stay 
stick to the rules of the past and or uh, less innovative rules because he has always been a revolutionary man in one way or another. We were lucky because the happy connection between him and the orchestra remained for all the time he was principal conductor. And as you know, uh, no concert was but a magic and unique event. I have to admit that there have been ups and downs, uh, the connection uh, between the principal conductor and his orchestra is very tight, like a marriage, and things are never smooth. Uh, his disease, uh, which began in the year 2000, made us wiser and more reasonable. We became more sensitive and more respectful. In 2002, Claudio decided not to extend his contract anymore. From then on, he devoted himself to the festival orchestra Luzern, uh, which he founded. Anyhow, he came back every year to conduct other marvelous concerts with us. In general, uh, it is only uh, the uh, conductors who are dead are often glorified. Claudio was glorified and adored already during his life. But what made Claudio so extraordinary? Uh, right before being elected principal conductor, uh, Claudio conducted the third symphony by Brahms. I don't believe that he has ever thought for a minute to be able to seduce the public in our orchestra with this particular performance. I have played myself, and I can testify it. This was not a common concert. Something happened. And what happened is exactly what makes an orchestra decide. We want to stick to this person. We want him. We need him. What was so exceptional about it? The third symphony by Brahms was performed uh, by, with many other appreciated conductors. Herbert von Karajan's interpretation was still very present. Some fabulous concerts which we have uh, performed with Claudio uh, cannot be either designed or studied. The magic moment just happens, and if it happens, it happens only during the concert, never or rarely during rehearsals. So what about the rehearsals then? What happened? With almost uh, any other uh, Conductor, there has been such a difference so evident as with Claudio. The first uh, rehearsal is an approach, an orientation, and the concert is the brilliant culmination of a process. Uh, when I asked Ludwig Quant, our um, uh, leader uh, violin, um, if he remembered rehearsals with Claudio, he said uh, rehearsing with Claudio was often like uh, a journey on a ship in the uh, A's. Um, and I remember when we were desperate after a dressed rehearsal with the 5th of Beethoven in Salzburg. Uh, nothing uh, was working well, and uh, uh, the famous downs in the first movement were a disaster, but Claudio um, was not disturbed by it. He believed in miracles, probably, and uh, uh, he uh, led us to have one of the best performances of this symphony that I ever remember. Um, I don't know how it was possible. Probably Claudio was not just a great conductor, but also an incredible psychologist. I share Ludwig Quant's words in quotation, but I have another idea concerning what happened during uh, the rehearsals. Often musicians begin to work in this way. First the technique and then the music. How can I tell you? Uh, your image of the musical 
peace has to be so strong and has to already exist inside yourself. And then what follows is technique almost automatically by itself as a consequence of imagination. Claudio was always worried first about the music and then about the technique. One can also say everything starts from the inside and then is being transported outside. Uh, outside movements are managed by music and not vice versa. Probably this was the reason why rehearsing was a little disaster sometime. But now I'd like to stop with uh, rehearsals to talk about it, uh, because for me mm, these are a private thing. But there are um, concerts that touch us, and concerts remained in our memory. With a little creativity, the musical image, uh, a stylistic feeling, good taste, technique, and at the end the performance of his own uh, musical idea are the basis that a, a conductor needs. But what is the difference between a good conductor and a very good, magic, immortal conductor like Claudio? I am not sure whether I'm able to do that, but I'd like to try to tell you how maybe Claudio was able to get to this goal. In a thanking letter to the orchestra after his first official uh, concert uh, as a principal director, he wrote, Unsere gemeinsame Liebe zur Musik fand darin im Konzert der schönsten Ausdruck. Mehr noch, für mich wurde die Seele dieser Musik zum Erklingen gebracht. A common love for music has found into the concert its most beautiful expression. Indeed, for me, the soul of this music became alive. Uh, one cannot express himself in a most wonderful way. There is no music without a soul. But he describes it in an even m m more wonderful way. When I work on a score, I unconditionally fall in love with music, and this state of infatuation is gradually transferred to the orchestra during rehearsing. Therefore, it's love for music. But uh, loving music is not enough. One also has to be able to transfer, to pass this love on to uh, musicians, this soul of music, to both the musicians and the audience. For instance, for me, his long musical phrases seemed endless, like an endless breath. Breathing means giving space not only to lungs. Um, breathing means to continue moving and be alive. Some l slow movement by Gustav Mahler or um, uh, acts of uh, Wagner's opera never seemed long or without tension. I never understood how he managed to keep us alert and seated uh, on our chairs without actually um, having our attention fall. Uh, Claudio's attacks has never been abrupt, but I've always had a natural breathing. He knew that it's not just a singer who has to breathe before beginning, but also us musicians. An unforgettable thing is his body language. His movements were always elegant, with an enormous intensity and a mental tension at the same time, without showing any physical tension or muscular effort. This is so important for us musicians. If your body gets tense, it's difficult to breathe and produce a natural and warm sound. Together with body language, I also would like to point out his aesthetics um, that accompanied him always. Beauty will save the world, he used to say. Uh, these were words uh, by Dostoevsky, but uh, they were perfectly 
uh, well suited for Claudio. And then also I would like to talk about the routine. Playing a musical piece sometimes can cause a certain um, boredom. With Claudio there was never routine, never boredom. And every single performance was a new experience and every concert uh, increased in terms of quality. Claudio never stopped and he always looked for beauty, purity and perfection. Although his success was big, as always tried um, to always extract more from a composition without ever overcoming a certain threshold. His musical taste was so perfected that he has always complied with the composer's will. You can s perfectly see it from the indications on his scores. Uh, he never changed what was prescribed by the composer, but he un underlined it. The only thing that you see are the doubling of the instruments in order to support the musical intention or to increase the volume. One or two um, second violins, uh, the doubling of the leaders or vice versa, or uh, the cellos doubled, uh, etc. Claudio was always honest and sincere vis-a-vis -vis the composer. Apart from his uh, sincerity vis-a-vis -vis the composers, I'd like to talk about another features that he had. Getting together with the uh, concert hall and his approach with space. It didn't matter where we were playing in the world. Claudio has always adapted and adjusted uh, the sound of the orchestra at its best vis-a-vis -vis the concert hall. Sometimes one was under the impression that it was the room adjusting to us. For instance, the famous uh, uh, Musikvereinsaal, the golden uh, uh, concert hall in Vienna. If uh, we had played as we are used in the Philharmonie in Berlin, the statues uh, around the room would probably ha uh, uh, crashed and uh, the uh, golden uh, decorations would uh, have uh, crashed as well. Claudio uh, has to uh, get always get closer to acoustics. He has always rehearsed to exploit all the acoustic opportunities of a concert hall, and he let us play piano, più piano, uh, and più piano again. But for him, it was fil zu laut, uh, troppo forte. And then we uh, could do something else, uh, play even more più piano. And uh, one of the things that uh, sounded impossible uh, for us uh, became reality. In a conservatory, you never um, learn playing pianissimo. As a soloist, uh, it's totally meaningless, but collectively in the orchestra, you can find and create a color and a magic atmosphere. I remember very well the ending of the Ninth Symphony by Mahler. This was an example of how pianissimo and very delicately we played. Each single musician practically did not dare to touch the chords, uh, but all together we have created this sound fragile, uh, dying out, uh, and uh, a, a sound which did no longer belong to this world. Apart from this magic pianissimo by Claudio, there is another aspect, the range of dynamics. This was so wide that rarely did I experiment it with other conductors. For instance, in the fourth movement of the six pieces by Anton Weben, uh, which we have very often performed with him, uh, starts with a sort of uh, uh, r pianissimo rattling of three minutes and slowly the volume increases with an enormous crescendo to end with a, uh, a clashing chord, very energetic and fortissimo. But also the fortissimo was never abrupt, never exaggerated, but always with a full-fledged uh, quality. 
in general, but especially during our journeys, uh, since we were playing in different concert halls, it was always a great challenge to find the right balance between uh, all the elements of the orchestra because of the diverse acoustics. Claudio has always been in a position of managing and adjusting the volume of the various groups perfectly well. When it comes to acoustics, I'd like to go back to talk about Berlin for a while and to talk about our Philharmonie. It was built in the 60s in a rather uh, uncertain uh, times, both politically and economically. Uh, the Berlin Wall, which I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, was built right at that time. But Herbert von Karajan was able to convince politicians that we needed to have a concert hall. And together with architect Hans Schaurun, uh, this masterpiece was built. I believe that Claudio liked a lot the Philharmonie, uh, since he had the characteristics to develop music from the inside towards the outside. Also, Hans Schaurun uh, built the Philharmonie from inside to outside by building the concert hall around the podium. We, the Berliner Philharmoniker, are a concert orchestra, but once a year uh, we um, uh, perform a lyric operatic work. This was a tradition created by Herbert von Karajan with the Easter festival in Salzburg and now in Baden-Baden. For us, this has always been a very special event. This uh, operatic work is being performed by the Philharmonie without uh, scenes without, and in a concerted form. Claudio had the idea to use all the space, practically almost all, all the concert hall for the artists. He did not want th that they would stand still in one place. He wanted to involve uh, the audience as well in the scene. Often singers were in the middle of the orchestra or, or the audience interpreting their roles. Uh, so the conductor, artists, and sometimes the audience became just a single unit see, without restrictions, either visual nor acoustic. And thanks to the seats, as if it were a vineyard, none of the 2,250 listeners is f too far from the podium. For Claudio, this being incorporated uh, adjusted very well to his dogma, primus inter pares. Another way of actually making the concert hall become alive uh, were his famous cycles Prometheus, Hölderlin, Faust, Shakespeare, Lieben Tod, Musik ist Spaß und Erden und zum Raum wird hier die Zeit. The passion of Claudio were not just the usual uh, programs of a concert, but whatever happened around it. And the chamber music, theatre, literature, um, acting and cinema, the uh, Philharmonie space was an ideal one for his goals. Before ending, I wanted to remind you another quality of his musical personality, persona. Claudio was never an autocrat or a tyrant. When he went before the Berliner Philharmonica after his election, he said, I am Claudio for all. This was something new for me and my colleagues. I am Claudio, I am one of you. It means that we have to make music together. I'm a musician and I want to be guided by you and vice versa, all in mutual respect. Claudio grew by playing chamber music and an orchestra is practically nothing but chamber music in a bigger version. Like Karajan, he has also encouraged we, the musicians, to take the opportunity and make the most of from playing chamber music. Um, listening to oneself is important as much as looking at your conductor. Apart this, and there's another aspect which was very important for Claudio, to be elected by the orchestra itself and not chosen by political reasons or for other reasons. 
we are very privileged for having the right of choosing our principal conductor. The fact that we have chosen Claudio gave us a new aspect vis-à-vis -vis the history of our orchestra, and we're filled with gratitude uh, for this exceptional time. I'm sure that Claudio's spirit continues to live in our, our hearts and in the musical world. Well, I do thank Eva Maria Tomasi uh, and uh, thank you so much for having, uh, for having uh, used Italian as a language of presentation. I admire that so much, your ability to participate, your willingness to share, which is absolutely matching everything we're saying. There are so many insights and input that we could actually speak through and expand upon in terms of space, for instance. Space that was being created by a core, by a center that goes on and on, well beyond the venue, well beyond the concert hall to deliver it outside. And uh, actually the heart, whatever moves everything, is still music. And this lesson uh, was uh, absolutely greatly appreciated through your presentation. So um, this form of communication is very unique. I'd love to and um, I've locked together questions, if any, because I, I would like to devote a five minute time to questions, if any. Well, after such a, a beautiful and warm-hearted presentation, and also because you had a, such a direct relationship that I experienced with Claudia Bado, I don't know whether there are questions perhaps springing up from the presentation or else because of the experience that the person has gained with Maestro Bado. Anybody Anybody want to break the ice? Oreste Bussini. Thank you. I have a question. So if we take Claudio Bardo with respect to uh, Karajan or Simon Glatter before, was he asking for a specific positioning of musicians? Uh, you, what would you, would you mean by that, the setup? I mean the setup on stage. Would he, would he be after a special setup? Well, that, that's a very good question. Not, not that I can recall. No, he never really changed it. He never asked for a different setup to be in place. Perhaps he did change first violence and second violence, but he never really changed the setup when he joined. Well, the presentation of Mrs. Tomasi has uh, actually reawakened many memories in, in myself as well from many past concerts. Uh, I, I'd love to remember Percival Salzburg 2002. Perhaps uh, on that occasion, he actually asked the first violence to be positioned on the opposite side so that they could actually play opposite to the audience uh, to deliver, of course, a, such a, a kind of an indirect sound. Yes, very true. Salzburg, first violence, were actually replacing second violence position. Yes, very true, because they sound better. And this is something that they start in Vienna and uh, and uh, right after Vienna. Well, it, it wasn't something that Karajan had asked for. He, he he used to position them in a standard manner, first violence, second violence. So, true. Well, if I 
No. If I may to step in in this discussion of setup uh, and also the of course the sound result in the venue well, it's very interesting when you spoke about dynamics is the pianissimo versus fortissimo so those sound dimensions that are either being introduced gradually or else uh, they really lead uh, to a clash without still without uh, ruining without spoiling and uh, so still being very respectful of the canvas which is a uh, which is let's say the, the room the venue where we are appreciating the sound and this is actually a topic that is going to be touch based upon uh, soon in the next presentations we'll hear from experiences of abado with nono curta um, so there's still room uh, room space for a uh, one last question if any Uh, well, I'd love to get back to the question. So what what Claudio changed? Well, he had uh, the he had, uh, he wanted singers not to be in front of the orchestra, but actually behind the orchestra. Not necessarily uh, they were all in agreement uh, with such decision, but then in the end they, they, they realized that it was the best decision to be made. So was he experimenting on that as well? Of course, yes, he used to experiment a lot. So unless there are any... Other question, I'd love to thank Eva Tomasi. And I would love to welcome our next speaker, Lorenza Burrani. She will uh, perhaps carry on and uh, in, uh, in what has been already spoken about, so relationship uh, with, uh, uh, with orchestra musicians, orchestra, uh, Chamber of Europe, I don't want to anticipate anything. I know that there's a video that will be that Lorenzo Brani will ask to be played. So as opposed to introducing and by the way bios can be read in the program of course as we said yesterday so as opposed to introducing I'd love to leave the floor right away to Lorenza Baroni and uh, to the video she wants to play uh, right at the beginning of her presentation thank you thank you so much yes hel hello everyone good morning everyone Thank you so much for this kind invitation and thank you so much for allowing me uh, to be part of this discussion analysis the way we want to call it. I'd love to introduce myself as a musician who has been part of uh, many orchestras and entities that Abado has established, has founded. And I'm still first violin of the uh, Chamber Orchestra of Europe, which he developed, which he founded many years ago after meeting up with a happy generation of musicians beginning of the 80s uh, they were uh, they were uh, they had been part uh, of the young orchestra in those years but they, they wanted to play together so claudio came up and said why don't we found a new orchestra with these young musicians and uh, and 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 that was what was happening and actually he had this idea of uh, creating the future already I've been part of Mo Mozart Orchestra, Luzern Orchestra. I have played with Mahler Chamber as well. So I had this opportunity of experiment uh, and surely live uh, and spend uh, uh, a part of my journey next to next to this master genius. And actually, I couldn't agree more with what Elena Tomasi said around magic during rehearsals and during concerts. And uh, so, uh, of course, uh, most of what I'll be talking through uh, refers back to what Mrs. Tomasia already uh, said. So when, when I was invited to, to speak uh, through this, uh, to speak through Abado and Abado and space, well, I, I tried to consider the many different ways uh, one may actually interpret uh, the, very, the very meaning of it. And uh, speaking through the set of uh, musicians, actually, what came to mind uh, to me is that with us, with Mod 
art, uh, Mozart Orchestra. He experimented a lot in, in terms of the positioning musicians uh, around. And it was very dear to him to open up uh, strings, for instance, and uh, allowing woodwinds uh, to step in. So two flutes, two oboe, the first row of wood actually would be between cellos and second violins. Uh, so cellos and second violins, uh, he would he would always play with uh, cellos, violins, violas, and it would open space between violins and uh, cellos, and it would allow uh, woodwinds uh, to be in. Uh, because uh, usually there are kind of a dualism being created, where else perhaps uh, it was very much envisaging a more of a chamber music approach, and that it wouldn't really change according to the repertoire. It would it would always be the case as long as the stage would allow it, and uh, this is because I was I was still answering back to the question that was raised a moment ago. Also, if we speak through physical spaces and venue, perhaps it is is not is not just is not very much up to me to speak to that because uh, so many of us know about the venues that Abado wanted to open, reopen, and uh, concert halls as well that he he strongly wanted to be reopened. Uh, it, it was impossible to stop him. Literally, if there was a single space that could be devoted to music, well, that very place, that very venue was to be reopened. And uh, even despite there were other venues that were being built meanwhile for that specific purpose. Um, and actually, uh, considering the years uh, I spent with with Bardo, there were two kind of earthquakes that we experienced, if I may say so. Um, I remember the opening of the auditorium in Aquila following the earthquake in 2009. And I remember May 2012 in Bologna when at 8 a.m. in the morning, we were literally reconvening right after the earthquake because the earthquake uh, has a uh, uh, walk us up. Uh, and we were already doing rehearsal 11 a.m. in Manzoni, not really knowing whether that was the wisest decision that was made. Uh, but the feeling was re we have to rehearse. So the theater may collapse on our head, but we will still do our rehearsal. Well, not everybody was com was comfortable with that decision being made. Uh, but actually, it made it possible for the municipality theater actually was reopened right after. I have to say that even firemen uh, were, were very were, were very fast uh, uh, to make it possible for the theatre to be reopened as soon as possible. So, I was lucky enough to be on this journey next to Maestro Abado. Uh, in those years, uh, in those years uh, that are very critical to a musician, when you're aged around 23, 24, and you're Try and understand what you want to do of your of, of your life, music-wise, and I and I. It was perhaps by chance, but it was also by luck that uh, I was able to be on a journey, part of my journey with Maestro, uh, Maestro, who was uh, for sure the most capable in enlightening, encouraging, and raising enthusiasm and excitement in people. And uh, of course, I will never be grateful enough uh, to him for that. Also, because I was feeling literally that he, he loved, he enjoyed uh, exchange with new generations. We're now speaking through uh, listening to the new, listening to the future, and we know how important this is, and not just for music purposes, but it, it is it, it is crucial to be able to listen to the future. Well, back then, uh, and as musicians, we felt that we would be listened to by Maestro Bardo. I have to say that. So speaking through space again, and uh, whilst I was wondering how can I speak through space in my in my story today, so what what is it that made about us all lightning a uh, for for a musician for a young musician? I well I have to say that uh, one of the key reasons, well on top of his uh, talent creativity, which of course uh, are, are not uh, uh, are unbeatable, um, I think. That Abado was not ashamed of a of showing a, the extent to which he was having fun. He was literally enjoying what he was doing. Uh, I remember when I was working with the Mars.
Mozart Orchestra has been perhaps a, a let's say, the, the years of the greatest excitement and enthusiasm and fun to some extent. And he never really hid that, you know. That was never hidden because uh, as high and uh, as important is the job you're doing, well, still, what we're doing can be also fun. We've played with music, literally, uh, in those years. Well, Italy can be a misleading language, um, at, uh, especially if we compare it to French, Spanish, English, and German. Perhaps Italian is the is the one language that need to do different words to say play, you know. Play for us uh, is, uh, is actually translating two different words, uh, if it's the fun side of it or if, if you're playing an instrument. Whereas in abado, the, 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 these two Italian words are actually blended together uh, as, if, as, if, uh, as in the English case. Um, now, of course, I don't want to raise a, a funny reaction to that uh, because I, I was also having my own reactions back then. But I remember during the lockdown here, we felt that we were underrepresented. Um, we felt that we were left alone when we saw that the world cultural art are there just for kind of fun purposes or developing passions. Well, we were kind of overreacting to that. And, and of course, uh, what I'm saying saying it has to be fit into a special context. Perhaps we, we just wanted to hear different language, you know. But I, again, I was also reacting to those declarations, to those statements. And that made me think that actually playing music, making art, uh, uh, making culture, being part of culture, you know, if you're doing that, if you're experiencing that with the right attempt, with your right intention, it can be fun. That's true. That's very true. We tend to hide this side, you know, because we're afraid that we're not being taken seriously enough. And unfortunately, this is the case. Um, still, I'd love to share that the moment we were shut indoors of Manzoni and we were doing a rehearsal in the Mozart Orchestra with Claudia Bado, there was pure fun. When I say pure fun, it's the highest meaning of that. Uh, so do you have the fun of doing something, uh, of doing something well, doing that with passion, uh, searching for the personality itself of music. And I, and I hope I'm not being uh, misunderstood as well. The way that only the, uh, let's say, the kind of the highest way uh, we can experience that. And also, another side to Abado, which is, a, which is extremely engaging and involving this uh, endless curiosity that was never retired. They, 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 so his curiosity to experiment, to seek, to explore new repertoires and uh, finding a new way to listen. Well, on these, uh, so these two, these, uh, these two elements, these two components uh, actually uh, it made me uh, help me understand that when Abado was interacting with younger generations, he would allow this very younger generation to, to grow with a different vision around the future. Perhaps a vision that was closer to his, to his own. And um, actually, that even made it possible for a happy relationship uh, to be created. And Professor Pulcini described it very well in a publication on Manifesto. So this uh, joyful relationship uh, between uh, musicians uh, and Abado, which is something that also Eva mentioned earlier on. And uh, if I want to seek for other reasons, it is because it was also sharing accountability. And uh, Claudio, um, wanted musician to feel accountable uh, about what was going on during the performance, uh, during their execution. And uh, it would happen uh, that uh, musicians will still carry on rehearsing even after he had finished his session. And that is something that conductor might be annoyed by, you know, to some extent, because they feel that music, they might feel that musicians might impact uh, what was overall achieved uh, during that session. And he was never 
actually felt that. It was, it was never putting that at stake. He wanted, it was almost happy that that would happen because the musicians could interact to develop relationship. And he could uh, have this, uh, this additional opportunity for listening. And, uh, and he would feel even more engaged in the listening session uh, and, of course, in the conducting afterwards. So we always felt truly accountable about what was going on. And feeling accountable, I think it does allow uh, to create that relationship. So um, also because you're making each and every single person feeling accountable on his own, on their own. So usually we say that conductor is, is the person providing tempo. To me, Claudia Bardo was, was the person providing space, the space that I would define the space in between the notes. And uh, so even space, music, tempo, these are all concepts. They're all tied to the concept of freedom, uh, freedom in the in a performance, uh, the freedom that you may take as you play an instrument, which is a, a, a different concept from uh, individualism. So anybody playing in a, a chamber orchestra knows that you can't actually mingle these two. Um, so you must have a clear in mind the difference between this these two aspects. When I say uh, freedom of music uh, uh, moving in in time as as actually music flows in time and as it does it it does describe gestures and he describes architectures uh, abado was a was a capable to provide each and every gesture and architecture the right space they needed uh, the right space the musician needed um, and now I, I don't want to speak on behalf of everybody who played with him, but uh, but perhaps those that I have spoken to, I I believe they were all sharing this very feeling that any moment we felt that we had the quantity of space that we felt we needed, that we wanted to have, but it was indeed it was actually him giving us that space. Perhaps we felt that that was exactly the space that we wanted. Or perhaps there was this beautiful, unbelievable empathy uh, between us, amongst us. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, the bottom line was that we had this beautiful sense uh, of uh, harmony that uh, would provide uh, this feeling of a, a, such a broad breath uh, uh, unity, uh, which is what Eva mentioned also earlier. And to me, this has been perhaps the most peculiar uh, aspect that I remember. Um, so this uniqueness, uh, peculiarity uh, that we were all experiencing, which was not there all of a sudden, uh, the moment uh, he would leave the podium, perhaps uh, he was he was a, he was a, a giving up for a moment. He would he would leave the podium for a moment, and of course we musicians we were absolutely able to listen to one another, to listen to uh, to to. to to listen, uh, but actually that very freedom was kind of being diminished the moment he would leave the podium. And this is fairly normal when a conductor is leaving the stage, you know? I mean, that and that is the key role of, a, of, an, important, uh, of an important conductor such as Bardo. Uh, but my impression is that that very feeling that Maestro Bardo had of giving, providing freedom and space was the pre-requirements for us to to, to, to play well, and he was very much at the base of his own conducting technique. And uh, something else that a uh, Professor uh, Tomasi mentioned earlier on as well, the phrasing, the breathing. Uh, now, the phrasing from Abado is unmistakable, literally, uh, because he, he always had this breath. His breath is the, is the space between phrases. Phrasing is how phrases are being combined uh, in, a, in, a, in a music discourse, uh, which is also dear to Arnold Kaur. So the way he would breathe, uh, the way he would separate phrases uh, in a phrasing was one of a kind, as he would be able to separate still not giving up unity and continuity. And uh, in some uh, some ways, uh, there was his turn. His turn was there. I remember Mozart. Uh, 
So that breath uh, between the first and the second phrase, it was always different, but it was always his, but it was always different. And it would be recognizable amongst thousands of performances, I have to say. And I, I do recognize Claudia Abado in, in, in space, in his space also. And that is a, a pondering, something I had pondered also, and perhaps we may play the video in a moment. Um, that it looks like a with a, whilst providing tempo, he has also given extra space to his gesture. He was from the school of Hans Varosky. I don't want to dig into any details here, uh, but I know that Hans Varosky's school. Um, so he used to teach a, a very clean, essential, uh, neat gesture, and he would uh, he would recommend uh, to do little strokes with the with the with the wrist. So he would work. Uh, uh, a lot, a lot with wrist. And about though, would do this when he wanted to be really neat, when he wanted to adjust the things in a more of a strict manner, he would use his wrist uh, with a little strokes, really. And uh, so, out of curiosity, I, I went back to see uh, one of his video being uh, recorded as he was a young conductor. Our three assistant conductors, the three young men who are chosen for that season to work with the Philharmonic. And this season, they happen to be all foreign borns one from Italy, one from Argentina, and one from Czechoslovakia. So our dinner, uh, sorry, I mean our program, is uh, really going to have an international flavor. We're first going to hear our gifted Italian assistant, Claudio Abado, who will conduct Ravel's introduction and allegro with his three fine young soloists, Miss Lee Walder, Mr. Berry, and Mr. Eisenberg. So you may appreciate in the video the very gesture of Abado. It is still very structured and providing, providing tempo first and foremost. 
uh, the gesture we came to know, we became familiar with, uh, was a gesture that it seemed to give out everything with the accept of tempo. And uh, so he wanted to provide the shape, the music, the intention. He would evoke structures, uh, uh, characters, proportions. Uh, it was extremely evocative. Uh, but it was a it, it was a gesture that was being freed by this framework uh, that he had uh, grown with, grown up with, if you will. So my impression is that uh, at some point he decided that he wanted to give himself to give himself extra space on how he would open his arms. Uh, and that, that is the abado that we lived, that we experimented. Uh, so truly evocative uh, arms opening as well. There's one. There's one last uh, thing I'd love to ponder uh, around is about listening. And um, Claudio Vado used to insist a lot on being, e being able to listen to oneself. And, uh, and that is a kind of a, a popular reference perhaps you all, uh, you all know of already. But I'd love to share an extra pondering from my side. In a play together, Listening uh, is a is a bit is a bit different. It's a bit differentiated because usually you listen to something that has already taken place. If you listen, it means that that has already happened or it is happening. Uh, so you have to be familiar with it if you're able to listen. Uh, so you have to kind of expect something and then you you listen. Whereas the listening that uh, Abado used to talk about uh, is very much associated to this network of empathy uh, that he was able to to establish and it is a listening that happens with your head uh, with your which you had before it happens with your ear set, uh, because everybody else is playing, they're playing their instruments at the same time. So you have to kind of anticipate. And uh, back to the title of this very conference, uh, so you have to be able to listen, but also listening to the future. And that is my last pondering. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorenzo, for this other magnificent uh, set of uh, memories filled with Claudio Abado's uh, teachings. There is an idea that I'd like to reiterate before asking you whether you have questions. Uh, playing. Uh, Italian out of the languages that I know uh, has no difference between playing and playing as a game. And there is nothing more serious than game because uh, game means respecting. And uh, it is along this line of the, the uh, eagerness of playing with the orchestra that Claudio used to have uh, can be interpreted with respect uh, and being in, to a certain extent shy because you respect music so much. But I'd like to know whether there are other curiosities and or uh, questions and or comments to make um, after this presentation. To you, the floor, please. Good morning. I have a curiosity. Uh, also listening to the previous lady speaker who actually told us uh, uh, that uh, after his election at the Bellina, uh, he said, uh, I am Claudio and I am Claudio for all of you. And you call also uh, about Claudio. Was it really so? Did he really want to uh, be called Claudio, or is it just an affectionate way for you to uh, remember him? Oh, no, 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 no. He wanted to be called Claudio, so I used to call him Claudio. But uh, uh, I, I make an effort 
because for me he is always a bardo. But uh, with him, he really cared a lot. Uh, he cared a lot to be called uh, uh, Claudio. Also, emperors used to uh, want to be called by their own Christian name. Uh, but yes, for him, it was very important to have a very, very straightforward relationship with musicians, and he wanted to be called by his own Christian name. Um, and I have another question, talking about space, the relationship inward and outward. Uh, when it comes uh, to my own person, an experience. Uh, it was Claudio, but outward, uh, what remains of him is Abado, the conductor. Uh, this is again a way of playing around with words and being respectful. Um, I, I am Claudio. That's the first thing I heard when I first met him, as, as if to say there is no maestro here, but only Claudio. But this is in, in, in an interpersonal space. Outside Claudio remains Adrian, the emperor, you know. And uh, uh, this is uh, a name uh, which uh, it's not meant to uh, take away respect. Any other question or any other curiosities and or comments also? Given that we have talked about uh, the orchestra, we have the chance of uh, being able to talk to someone who have worked with ma the maestro. Well, in the event that there are no questions, I would thank you once more to you, uh, Mrs. Lorenza Borrani. We are perfectly on time. That's pretty incredible. So the next presentation is by Ciel Agugliaro and uh, this will be a video presentation. He works in America at Pennsylvania University. Unfortunately, he was unable to attend. And his presentation takes us slowly towards declining uh, the idea of space, but taken more physically, not only more physically, but also referring to what we were saying about listening. There is an ecology of listening in specific spaces where to listen to music, therefore building up or thinking about new opportunities to listen in spaces which are specifically built for some concerts. And uh, I'd like to have uh, Mr. Ciela Gugliaro's video. I'm not mentioning the title because uh, so before uh, beginning I just wanted to thank uh, Angela De Benedetti uh, Bussini and the scientific committee the steering committee for this uh, conference for having involved me uh, and also thanks to all the people from the Claudio Abado Foundation for having supported my research from afar as a, and having made possible my work I'm sorry I cannot be present in person and uh, mm, taking into consideration that I worked at La Scala in the archives of the theatre, and I had uh, carried out uh, research for many years, and I would have pleased to be there. Um, but anyway, I'm here virtually, and I really wanted to really thank you all for having allowed me to take part to this conference. Un libro a book was in the mind of Claudio Abados during his last years of life. There were no words, but only images of music and nature. The title of the book in Italian was Concert by Trees, but uh, what was uh, chosen in the original French, Diapason, uh, expresses the connection between music and natural space imagined by Claudio Abado. The history told in the book is the uh, uh, um, uh, director uh, uh, and uh, gets on the tallest one to start the concert. Instead of the musicians, you have uh, the leaves uh, that uh, become alive, and then they float around in the air and create uh, birds and clouds uh, guided by the conductor. At the end of the concert, leaves go back on the trees, and after having bent the uh, conductor, uh, uh, 
puts his baton in the ground together with the uh, trees, and then this baton gets the roots, and there is a new young uh, tree uh, growing up. After Deverney's book in 2010, uh, Bardo uh, gave several copies to friends and uh, people and uh, commissioned to, to Felix Mendoza from Venezuela and a uh, member of the Mozart Orchestra a musical work presented in the 2015 edition of the festival devoted to the memory of the maestro. He loved music as much as nature, as Mendoza said. Uh, he has grown in all of us who were fortunate enough the magic of his gesture and the purity of his music by itself. Uh, with all my love, I dedicate every single note of this uh, score. So, seeding the baton is interpreted by Mendoza from a human point of view. The concert uh, um, director, uh, the, the, I mean the concert conductor, um, uh, makes his uh, his uh, disciples grow, but uh, he also has to uh, act on the site because a tree has an independent life. Uh, wood is not the um, stage uh, for a future memory. Uh, the conductor knows that he is transient and he knows that his task is to grow as many trees as possible. Apart from the metaphors, some clues lead us to imagine that the history told in the book can be interpreted it also literally. Abado had a great interest in terms of environmental sustainability, and you will certainly remember the famous request of 90,000 trees um, in exchange for his comeback on the podium of La Scala after 20 years of absence. But uh, a connection between music and nature has accompanied most of Abado's careers. In a 2010 interview, he said that his passion for gardening was inherited by his mum and had a direct connection with uh, being a musician and an artist. Uh, when I interrupt my studying and start walking in my garden, my score starts uh, resonating in my mind um, as if I were to study among trees once more. During the same interview, uh, uh, somebody like Renzo Piano explained his theory uh, as far as the interest of the conductor vis-a-vis -vis, uh, trees. In the green, there is something ephemeral and temporary in one way or another, there is something that belongs to the very dimension of music and sound. Piano's words have to be uh, uh, meant not only in terms of his relationship with Abato, but also taking into consideration a long series of professional collaborations between one and the other to design some concert halls. Among them, we have uh, architectural works uh, that uh, were finished, uh, and others only to a certain extent. Uh, um, there were lots of public discussions, but uh, they were never finished. An idea of these concert halls as presented uh, within this particular collaboration allows to focus on a musical space inspired to an idea of musical world and developed uh, together with Renzo Piano and other people. At the very beginning of this idea, you have to take into consideration a specific experience, Prometheus by Luigi Nono, uh, first presented in 1984 in Venice, uh, conducted by Abado. The tragedy of uh, listening to that um, um, wanted to have an, uh, a structure project, uh, designed by Renzo Piano and uh, made in wood. Uh, Renzo Piano said that that particular project uh, came from the intention of creating a temporary ephemeral structure allowing for a natural interaction between space and music. The arc in wood uh, was like uh, an harmonic box in which musicians on three levels were were uh, surrounding uh, the audience. The arc was used both in Venice on the opening uh, in the desecrated church of St. Lawrence in December 1984 and the opening of this operatic work in Milano a few months later. It was thought to be assembled and disassembled in the various concert halls, but because of technical problems, this particular arc was then dropped. Oreste Bossini's interview um, to Renzo Piano 
Bourguignon led him to explain that this was a kind of joke to Carlo Maria Badini, the superintendent of La Scala, um, who produced this uh, together uh, with the Biennale in Venice, and to celebrate uh, the conclusion of the project by setting fire to the structure. Now, of course, this was rejected because of environmental considerations and also because it might have been accused uh, to have wasted the money for the production. Now, such a proposal highlights once more not only the transient uh, character of the project, but also more general thought about the organic state of musical space intended as a living organism made by um, a number of different stages to its natural conclusion. Based on Prometheus' experience, this would become a reference for new projects related to uh, building new musical space. Luciano Abbado Pestalozzo in 2008, as a secretary of the General Association Milano Musica, um, indeed uh, um, wanted to have a space for contemporary music. In an article appeared on the Corriere della Sera, he explained that the new auditorium should have favored a new way of uh, um, listening to music, not only frontally, but um, there should be a possibility of having different uh, uh, varieties of acoustic outcomes, etc., according to the specific needs of the musical works to be performed. The um, auditorium project is being given to Gabriel Abado, uh, Claudio's brother and um, disciple, and um, Simone Abado, who's an architect as well, and has given some materials uh, from his own private archives. The space by Gabriele Simone um, uh, was uh, built around different spaces, uh, both on stage and uh, for the area to the audience, so that uh, the barriers between uh, audience and performers could be pulled down according to the various needs of the various scores. The uh, pattern inspired um, by the auditorium was in the preliminary sketch in 2008, uh, was similar to Prometheus' arc, a, a pattern that allowed for the integration of each single uh, musical score into the architectural structure of the concert hall, but left it in the hands of the director or conductor, soloist or orchestra. This is a preliminary project. The space imagined by Gabriel Simone Abado has never been carried out in Milan or um, in a similar structure uh, to be built up in Arezzo. But the reference to such a specific experience and very far in time as Prometheus shows how ideas in that particular project were very present not only in Claudio Abado's work but also family members involved in designing musical spaces. The shade of Prometheus' arc uh, is also part of another couple of concert halls designed by Piano. The first is bar in 1990. Uh, during the Berlin Philharmonic concert inside uh, the former uh, Fiat factory in Turin and then opened in 1994 was the Giovanni Agnelli Auditorium, uh, which was set up after having refurbished uh, the area of Lingotto and designed by Piano for Abado and the Berlin Philharmonic. Uh, as like the arc, uh, the acoustic uh, could be changed uh, and could indeed uh, be used to, to free the sounds according to the symphonic concert or a conference, thanks to a system of panels and, and partitions. Uh, the second concert hall, which was never finished, uh, was the Auditorium of the Arte in Bologna, a space thought by Abado in 2011 um, for what had become his adopted city. That particular project uh, um, was was a vertical structure according to the vineyard-like uh, architectural style well, had different levels around uh, the orchestra. Because of acoustics, this concert hall is being described as the tip of the point of a ship into the uh, modern art museum where the auditorium was to be built, uh, had to be uh, made entirely in wood. As in the case of the Prometheus Arc, Piano defined uh, this room a great 
harmonic box, a gigantic Stradivari, uh, to be compensated with planting ap approximately 400 new trees. The theme of the ephemeral comes back to the last work by piano in collaboration with Abado. In the days immediately after the Abruzzo um, earthquake in April 2009, um, he got contacted to build up a concert hall in L'Aquila. The damages because of the earthquake uh, uh, left the city without one of its most important cultural centers. Piano and Abado started to uh, build ephemeral a concert hall where performances could be hosted. Piano designed a wooden auditorium with materials made uh, available to the province of Trient and the choice of wood and timber was indeed um, uh, dictated by um, the uh, structure that had to be protective in terms of earthquakes. Um, the uh, timber came from Val di Fiemme, which is world famous, uh, turned the auditorium itself once more into an ideal uh, musical structure together with the Spanish uh, castle. The choice of the cube uh, as a form of the volume together with the slanted auditorium suggesting uh, the form of a big die, a pair of dies in a precarious balance, uh, highlights once more the transient uh, idea of the concert hall, especially in just opposed uh, to the castle in front of it. Uh, the planting of approximately 200 trees around the auditorium to compensate uh, the uh, surface and the timber used strengthens the material and poetic um, uh, relationships between the natural world and music. In, in spite of the fact that this was meant to be a temporary auditorium, it's still there next to the castle. And uh, in the case, the city would decide to remove it. Trees uh, planted at that time would um, have us reminded about it. To get back to uh, Abado's word, if it's true that the transient beauty of the trees is equal to the transient beauty of music, uh, there is nothing better than a tree to remember Claudio Abado, who made music so beautiful. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> So, uh, I had actually asked the speakers uh, to stick to timing, also because we're trying to fit six speakers uh, in the morning session, but it looks like I have threatened them, considering the speed that the, they've, spoken, they've spoken with. Uh, so many input. Uh, in this speech that we're going to also hear about uh, over the next speakers. Unfortunately, we cannot ask questions to Mr. Agugliaro. He has uh, spoken through interesting project, uh, uh, project that, that, uh, that often seem to be an accomplishment. But I've taken notes of uh, ephemer, ephemeris, which, uh, which takes us back uh, to the idea of uh, play, of the entertainment uh, that uh, we uh, heard before. And uh, we'll go back on, uh, on, on different, on, different uh, on, on many of these aspects that we spoke about. And we're going to be back uh, on the ephemeral uh, topics and that will be dealt with a, with the Chiappini in a Gabado and Marco Stroppa. I'd love to now break for 10 15 minutes and I I will ask you to reconvene in 15 minutes time and we'll hear from Elena Abado. Thank you so much.
Era prevista fino ai 40... Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we will kindly ask you to take your seat back. I'm very pleased to open this second part of the morning session with Elena Abado. She will she will take us through a new interpretation of the concept of space, which is both interpersonal and so no longer about the with musicians and orchestra, uh, but uh, with Georgi Kurtak, a composer, and also a composer in relation with the composition of sounds uh, that is, uh, they're not just coming from certain in instruments, but they come from orchestra that, uh, and are being played in very specific spaces. So, um, Elena will help us uh, understand more around this concept of space, and she will group uh, many different meanings uh, in her uh, speech, of course, uh, starting from the relationship between Abado and Georgi Kurtak. First and foremost, I'd love to thank the scientific committee for this kind invite, and I'd love to thank Benedetta Scandola, the Dada Benedictis uh, for the ongoing support throughout the research phase. Uh, so, out of the many composers uh, that uh, Abado has met up with, uh, Georg Kurtag uh, deserves uh, great attention in light of the artistic uh, value for both uh, artists. The recent, the recent production of uh, 2018 Fan de Partie has been only the last portion of an incubation stage that has led the Angorian uh, composer at the age uh, of, nine, of uh, 92 after long expectation, uh, um, over a decade uh, of wait. A relationship uh, with the uh, orchestra that has always been, always led to conflict and uh, that uh, was leading to the collaboration that Abado had wanted and that there had been, let's say, foreseen by Luigi Nono beforehand. So up until beginning of 90s, Kurtag was uh, known as a miniaturist. And uh, as he was bringing forward the research uh, around the recurring topics uh, that would see him uh, realize uh, short pieces uh, for small ensembles uh, with strong emotional engagement, 12 microludi, opera 13 for a string quartet, Kafka fragmente, soprano and violin, 86, and the first version of uh, 1989 and an endless uh, series uh, of uh, Jatekok Jokic. And I would love uh, to cling back to what uh, Borrani said uh, earlier on because uh, Jatek it means both playing as well as playing an instrument in Hungarian language. So Starting from the 70s, his work uh, has to do with some recurring topics, uh, homage to his friend musicians and uh, numerous pieces, uh, memoriam, as well as attention paid to Bach, Beethoven and Bartok, and the 30 long research of Samuel Beckett, a drama writer. So Abado was uh, stepping in between 88 and 2006 and was pushing the Hungarian composer to a very difficult journey towards uh, orchestral writing. It is important to mention the role of another composer, friend of both, Luigi Nono. Nono uh, had met Kurtag in the 70s, which is a period of time when they're developing a new program to renovate Italian culture through the teaching, music critique, and performances for workers. At the same time, it keeps promoting and fostering other composers, often young composers, still unknown to the large audience, especially Italian audience. So we are in uh, 1986, 
and, and this is the very key moment uh, where the friendship, uh, where the friendship is fully fledged. And uh, Nono is actually devoting a piece uh, to Kurtag and responding to an homage that he had received a few years before. This is a, a letter from Nono to Abado in Budapest, a night with Kurtag. We are friends, and he showed me a work, Fragments of Kafka, very beautiful and rare. His concert for piano and orchestra uh, is my understanding that it will never exist, as Kurtag is fearful of orchestra and the few rehearsals available. Perhaps you may reassure him and, uh, and convince him. So in light of the following developments of the relationships between Nona and Bado, well, this letter says a lot already. Still, we need to emphasize a number of names of composers that Nono would recommend to Abado, but only a very small selection then would have become part of the conductor's life. So the turning point in the interest towards Kurtak music starts from 1988 with the first, uh, first release of Vin Moderne, which was an event that was due to revolutionize the role of Vienna in brand new repertoire and also being propeller of music avant-garde. Recital of Shelton and Rassif were opera set from, uh, from uh, um, from Kurtag is played for soprano and piano. A bre brand new novelty conceived by Abado still happens in Vienna. Gustav Mahler, Jugend Orchestre in 1987, which is an initiative that helped young musicians coming from socialist Eastern countries, as we've spoken about yesterday extensively. So it, that provides a training experience, a very high quality, devoted not only to traditional repertoire, but of course it is permeated uh, by premier performances uh, and collaboration with contemporary composers. For the, and actually in this, this new investigation into scores uh, was unprecedented also because they had this opportunity to rehearse uh, for longer times. So when uh, Nono used to say he's fearful of few rehearsals available, well, that was indeed uh, one uh, one of the one of the reason uh, why it becomes very important uh, a letter dated june 1990 shows uh, as on that very date, Abado is looking forward uh, to involve the Hungarian composer in his future project. I will read the Italian translation, dear Mr. Kotag. I am glad I can inform you that we may enrich our festival, Being Modern, with a new aspect. Starting from 91 onwards, uh, every year we will run an international competition for composers. Every year, a different type of composition will become protagonist. I wish I could invite the best composers of our era to the jury of uh of, uh, of these competitions, like in programs of Vin Modern. For sure, we will encourage a young talent to participate, and I would be so glad and happy if yourself could be a juror in this competition. From his side, uh, the Hungarian composer had known Abado ever since uh, 83, ever since uh, he had received the written analysis uh, of the director from Opera 6, Weber. In this long interview dated 2002 that has been pu published by Angela Ida de Benedictis later on, Kurtag is saying, I've discovered that the fourth movement of that very opera was actually a funeral march at the beginning, and it had been written in the memory of his mother. In the version of 1928, Few indications, few expressive indications, particularly moving, touching, have been eliminated due to uh, due to circumstances. Uh, uh, then, due to uh, following uh, circumstances, uh, that uh, analysis uh, was made and uh, allowed me to see in Abado a kind of an angel from the sky. And then we met in Vienna during rehearsal of another opera.
In Din Modern, 1921, the real collaboration between the two is starting on the occasion of the festival devoted to Tarkovsky. It's been, they present What is the World, first work of Kurtag inspired to Sam Beckett. Opera was uh, originating uh, from the revision of uh, chamber piece music, uh, and uh, it was based uh, on the articulation of the of a language of an actress that, uh, following a car accident, uh, had been greatly criticised by the director to the point that she had developed uh, a trauma that to the point that she could hardly speak. Moniak, uh, she had the opportunity to sing both versions uh, up until 2008. Eight. As we may appreciate from the autograph on the score, the, the setup uh, of, uh, of the instruments uh, all over the venue was essential to create space among sounds. And this is here shown by the way uh, the setup is made of five different nuclei. Kurtag, in his music research, is very, uh, is very severe when it comes to self-criticism. For instance, in an interview, 2008 uh, on a German magazine, the composer was telling about the origination of what is the world. Well, if he had had more time to work on it, I would have enriched music for the vocal ensemble. Indeed, it is fairly poor the way it is, but unfortunately, time was limited because I was supposed to give the score to a bar in Switzerland. <laughs> Nel 1994 Claudio Abbado riceve il Siemens Music Prize, massimo riconoscimento nel campo della musica contemporanea. In quell'occasione Kurtag... Temporary music on that particular occasion, Kurtag and his wife Martha uh, perform a piano recital. When uh, Abbado was awarded uh, the prize, he asked us to perform. It was a surprise. We never thought that this was so important for him. And as you can see here at the center, Eva Marie Tomasi also performed on that particular occasion. Well, the second chance for cooperating with Abado uh, occurs in Berlin in 1993. Uh, Grabstein for Stefan, uh, op 15b for instrumental groups uh, dispersed into space. It's an elegiac uh, performance uh, composed by Kurtag uh, for the memory of Stefan Stein, singer and friend of his Parisian period. The first version is uh, guitar and uh, um, other instruments, while was uh, composed in 88, uh, based on notes of 78-79 uh, and performed in Segel in 89. Uh, the Berlin version is new and has been performed upon request by Abado, who le uh, learned of the first version by the Philharmonie and was wondering uh, what it was like uh, with a more numerous ensemble. Uh, as in uh, what is the word, uh, the uh, placement of instruments in different areas of the concert hall is an essential element of the composition. In the empty space uh, in between and among the various sounds uh, delimitate the textures uh, in the uh, memory space. Uh, at the center there's a guitar repeating at regular distance a pianissimo as if improvising the same harmony uh, with just a few notes changed. The opening is in Berlin on December 3rd, 1993 and a further performance in Köln on May 14, 1994. Kurtak, since uh, halfway through April 1994, uh, is working on the Stelle, uh, commissioned by the Philharmonie for the thematic cycle on the ancient. Uh, since it was impossible to be at the rehearsals in Köln, Kurtak uh, writes his performing uh, advice to um, Bardo and Berliner. Dear friend, I cannot come. I have to uh, finish your piece. If it's good for you to uh, read this letter to the Grabstein Ensemble. Um, if not, let's drop it all together. Please, uh, particularly at the beginning, uh, be careful with the uh, solo of the guitar and the echo vertical. It has to be a very simple part, but not sober and strong. And it cannot have be too um, quickly, um, but not even uh, um, uh, 
inaudible. And uh, to the Berliner, dear colleagues and friends, I unfortunately cannot attend uh, the real uh, the, re uh, the re rehearsings, but I want to s say something about that. This is uh, at the border of something not happening. The guitar keeps on uh, playing the same harmonic sequence from uh, the uh, empty chords to the major uh, C D uh, dieses. Um, you have maximum th two, three solo melodies uh, from three to five notes. Nothing happens. The piece might be absolutely meaningless or absolutely um, uh, mm, incredible, and it can be incredible only if uh, each one of you would believe it uh, and would give a meaning to um, apparently vacuum uh, meanings and all the others have to surround it with sounds and noise as I've uh, often heard and experimented in the classical repertoire uh, during rehearsals and in the Philharmonie concerts um, about uh, Kurtak's relationship vis-a-vis -vis Abado is characterized by silence. The composer's silence uh, is challenging uh, the uh, sense of uh, non-communication of his own work. Uh, um, and sometimes he feels the need of explaining with words his scores and its various shades, uh, aware that uh, what was written is not enough to understand the uh, work. Uh, about a silence was to indeed leave space to music and not to the language of the orchestra and to the responsibility of each single orchestra member. Contrary to what I have seen vis-à-vis -vis the preparation work for Grabstein with Abado, when it comes to Stelle, we do not have uh, letters by Kortak. Indeed, in the period of composition, he was in Berlin, so he actually contacted Abado on a daily basis. He had a residence of six months at the Philharmonie and uh, the uh, Wissenschaft the uh, colleague um, teaching for two years. And at the end, uh, he could uh, have a new interview with uh, Kurtak, uh, thanks to Elena Winkelmann and uh, one of Mahler members in 94. And uh, the composer pointed out uh, the um, feeling he f felt when he was in Berlin at the beginning of his residency at the uh, Philharmonie. Um, the uh, solo piano is dedicated to the the memory of a Hondra and the Mihai was a known composer, a, a conductor, and self-teacher. Uh, uh, and uh, he influenced uh, uh, generations of Hungarian musicians. Uh, we still ignore uh, the uh, reasons uh, for the dedication to him uh, of a section by Stile. Kortak said to us, it was after Mikhail's uh, death. I was uh, f for one hour with him who was dying and it was unforgettable. And the third movement by Stelle is very sostenuto and devoted to him. Kurta continues by telling more, um, and he said before his collaboration with Claudio Abado, he asked, what am, am I going to do uh, of what you have created in December? Uh, a, uh, a creation of uh, Mikhail uh, was scheduled because I couldn't write anything at the last minute. It. In the orchestra version, um, uh, the whole orchestra um, is playing a kind of a trattenuta um, uh, death march, and uh, the composer defines it, this is a piece of a music of someone who is wounded on a battlefield. People are fighting around him, but he just sees the sky um, very blue, and nothing is so important as uh, that sky. During his residence, Kurtag is so always at the Philharmonie is always uh, attending concerts and rehearsals that for a composer is the very essence of the preparation of the new piece uh, which was what will be uh, dedicated to the Berliner and Abado. Besides the artistic residence, the uh, conductor uh, offers uh, to rehearse with the Berliner and Mahler orchestras uh, by performing this piece once in Spain and then Austria before the official debut in Berlin on December 30th. 
13, 1994. The study of this piece before with the Mahler and then uh, with the Berliner is fundamental in order to uh, uh, guarantee the success of the piece. And Kurta continues by saying, Stella's creation was a true great cooperation. I was following all rehearsals and very often I asked uh, pieces of advice to Adbado in order to try to understand how to mm, uh, make my ideas on paper work. Uh, and uh, he comes and discusses with the composer everything. And uh, uh, even after the debut, everything goes on being developed. And this is a process which is fascinated, said Kortak. All this is, uh, was possible thanks to the uh, generosity and love for music uh, that Abado holds. And Kortak says to the conductor, um, I have written this piece for you. You are a king composer. And uh, uh, when we asked him what Abado uh, was like when he composed this piece for him, he said, uh, the piece exists and it's everything. Had it not invited me uh, today, it would not exist. In 1994, during rehearsals of Stele, Judith Kelly is recording uh, what uh, is to become Kurtag's documentary, The Majestic, Majestic Man in 1994. Let's watch uh, just a short excerpt that tells you more than words about the intensity and the collaboration between the two artists. Das ist nur zwei, drei, die anderen spielen weiter. Ja? In, 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 was ich, ich glaube, dass ja. wirklich, dass ich. Mhm. Und, und dann die, die, die Bläser. Die Bläser wie, wie ein Echo. So, ja? so ein Echo. Ja. Aber was, was mir eigentlich mhm. wichtig ist, ja. das Stück habe ich für dich komponiert. <lacht> und es ist jetzt, jetzt bist du der Komponist. Ah, nein, nein, ich finde es einfach. Und das einfach. ist toll, dass, also, dass du was in, in jeder einfach, Probe, dass, einfach, dass du alles einfach ein, ein, ein Gedanke vielleicht ja. äh, für den dritten Satz. Das ist äh, ja. sehr langsam, aber eigentlich ein Trauermarsch. Mhm. So, immer gehen. Äh, ich kann mir so, so vorstellen, dass es äh, also in, in, in äh, verlangsamte ja. Auf, Filmaufnahme ja. wie ein. Ja, wir also, brauchen so, Zeit, so, so, auch ja, ta, 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 ta. ja, Bam. ja, 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 ja,
Dopo un lungo silenzio, dopo... After a long silence due also to his disease, Abbado uh, conducts Cortex Music only in 2006. In that year, major European theatres have thematic festivals to celebrate uh, the 80th birthday of the composer. In Italy, we have uh, a festival in Bologna where the Mozart Orchestra creates a Cortex project in cooperation with Bologna Festival titled uh, The New and the Ancient. Besides the uh, four and uh, a piano concert by uh, the uh, Kurtags. He uh, conducts Mozart, his last performance of Grabstag for Stefan. Uh, to conclude the fundamental role by Abado in creating the best uh, conditions for Kurtag to compose eventually uh, opera, uh, orchestra works, uh, overcoming technical uh, drawbacks is, in my opinion, only one of the impact of the similarities emerging between these two artists through their letters. Two different spirits, uh, but constantly looking for listening and with a great devotion for respect and love for music. Thank you. Thank you, Elena Abado, for this beautiful presentation. It is also functional for us uh, to uh, further deep dive into this relationship between Kurtag and Abado. Kurtag, in his interview, spoke about the ability of creating a, a, a beautiful meetings. And that was an interview that had been requested by Claudio Abbado. And during the interview, all of a sudden, he, he stopped it and say uh, that there are some people who are so much uh, capable of uh, developing networks around them. And he mentioned Nono on that very occasion. And, and through Nono, he is uh, able to meet up with Abbado. So there's so many, uh, again, interesting uh, insights uh, that have to do with the collaboration between composer and conductor and the request to become co-composer, a uh, very utopic request, if you will. And uh, God knows whether it was mediated uh, by by the camera being being there, because every time, uh, of course, there are documentaries uh, uh, telling about the life of composers. We wonder about the uh, the real spontaneity uh, that exists, or perhaps say uh, we may wonder whether the director or a camera is actually influencing some of the answers. And that could actually be perhaps a topic for a completely different meeting and conference. I uh, would be still very interested uh, to, to see and understand whether there's anybody who has curiosity or wants to ask a question. Uh, with respect to the relationship between Abad and Kurtag, I'd love to say something. I'd love to add something. As I was preparing the speech, I was seeking for photographs that would uh, show the period of time in Berlin. And, uh, and I didn't really come across many photographs, so through two, three maximum. Uh, so the reason why I decided to play the video is to show that I could not find any different material in any different form or shape. But at least uh, I could show the way orchestra would work during rehearsal. So Kurtag in front of the camera, yes, indeed, he might have had a different attitude. But perhaps uh, I, in those very years, uh, I think I was uh, still in strongly emotionally engaged with Abado. And he was so very happy about the opportunity that he had been given. Uh, of course, uh, yes, I think that is a uh, no doubt, no doubt. And that has been actually being said loud and clear by Kurtag in, in the original interview that I gave to you. You can definitely appreciate and perceive the intensity of, uh, of, of their love, of their affection. And uh, 
and also you see this uh, um, the wife of Kotak, Marta, and uh, she would act uh, kind of a filter. So if Kotak could not uh, recall some uh, uh, details, uh, or memories, let's say, Marta would step in uh, to to trigger the next bit of the memory, the next piece of memory. I don't know whether anybody wants to add uh, anything about it or if I may now deep dive directly into you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Elena Abado, for being with us and for sharing your words. We're now leaving the floor to Michele Chiappini. He'll be speaking through the uh, bond, through the relationship between Carlo Abado and Luigi Nodo and surroundings. Uh, by the way, Elena, in her speech, she mentioned letters where Luigi Nono would recommend, uh, would, uh, would make some recommendations to Claudio Bardo. When Claudio Bardo was uh, starting to conceive programs in Vienna, uh, well, actually, you could, you could see these letters are filled up with exclamation marks. Uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm as there was a strong recommendations on a number of composers, and Marco Stroppa is one of those, uh, and he'd be, he'd be speaking um, before the end of the morning session. And we look forward to hearing from Michele. Michele, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And uh, thank you, thanks to Milano Musica and uh, uh, Claudio Barrett Foundations for this uh, prestigious invite. Thank you to the uh, researchers, Giovanni Cestino, Alessandra Calabrese, Ser Gugliaro. Thank you to the scientific committee, Ora Sabossini, Angela Ida, De Benedictis, and Benedetta Scandola. Um, in particular, well, she has uh, made huge efforts uh, to support uh, these last three months of research uh, as we were approaching the dates of this event. So, actually, many thanks is what I'd like to express uh, to you people who have been so profound and generous, uh, Angela Ida Benedictis, uh, to whom I am sincerely grateful. And uh, now, the speech that I'll be sharing with you, it goes uh, through the biography, artistic and human, of Luigi Nono, focusing on the development of the artistic marriages uh, that uh, he has had uh, with the most important conductors in his life. Hermann Scherchen, Bruno Maderna, and Claudio Abado. Each one of them, uh, as we will see, it marks uh, a very precise uh, chronology inside Nono's biography, and it is also associated to some specific performances of Nono. And each of the three actually participates uh, and uh, allows uh, even the evolution of the music thinking of Nono, showing that there was ongoing research uh, and progressive gradual awareness uh, of the composer. And that uh, was, uh, of course, uh, um, let's say, marking the detachment with respect to the past. But on top, uh, or let's say, beyond, uh, uh, beyond the bio, the mere uh, bio, I'd love to share with you three different shapes of artistic collaboration that may exist between a composer and a conductor who is performing uh, the composer's music. So, conductor who's been called the transfer form into sound a very complex system of ideas, thoughts, signs, and notes that have been communicated to him by the composer or by through people on his behalf. And how does that translate into music? Luigi Nono gets in contact with Hermann Session, summer 1948, participating to orchestra conducting class within the International Festival of Music in Venice, which is an historical event often reminded by Nono. Along with him, Maderna, they both meet the maestrissimo as a, many different times. They will call Session over in the, ne in the following years. In 48 uh, session, Nono is a myth, 
a symbol of, uh, of the evolution of music. After self-exile in Switzerland, he goes back to Germany and he is uh, teaching to newborn uh, summer classes in terms Darmstadt. Scherchen realizes uh, that Nono is a great composer, talented composer, and uh, he is uh, performing the Variazione Canonica in the 50s and the next year Polyphonica Monodia Ritmica. And around that performance, uh, I want to mention the very first piece of important piece of relationship uh, being established between Nono and Scherchen. As uh, here, you can appreciate the shape of their artistic collaboration. There are two letters uh, showing uh, this. Uh, they have a very, um, let's say, ongoing correspondence, but two letters are showing this more clearly. So the composer must have said how disappointed it was because uh, a great portion of his opera had been cut. And that was decided during the rehearsal, and perhaps the composer had only acknowledged uh, on the concert day, Scherchen's decision is is not at stake and is being legitimated, of course, by his authority. Nono is disappointed, but he can only accept the opera is being cut then and it will be published by the press at Ars Viva, as the conductor has wanted that to be. Starting from 51 up until 55, more and more insisting is the research of a, of a stricter collaboration between the conductor and the composer. It is both wanted by Scherchen and Nono for two different reasons. Of course, Nono wants to be a great composer in the eyes of Scherchen. Scherchen expects from Nono the, the perfect musical opera. And uh, he is often uh, speaking of that uh, expected opera as our opera. And in 55, Scherchen is asking to Nono, opera is a great, uh, is a great work, uh, work of art. And uh, although I'm working days and night, I would love to assist you so that we may uh, come up with the best opera ever and we make everything alive. Nono, then, he uh, is kind of uh, being considered as a missed adopted child of Scherchen. As all children do, he understands very quickly, thanks to Moderna as well, that he has different horizon and perspective with respect to what Scherchen is expecting from him. And from time to time, I have to say, from 55 onwards, uh, no, no, he's, he's almost in pain. And you can tell, and Scherchen is a, is, is a, a is realizing, is acknowledging that. And they exchange uh, other letters when they, all of a sudden it looks like they're no longer having the previous relationship. And the scenario seemed capsized with respect to the beginning. October 1957, Scherchen heading Berlin Philharmonica, he's conducting the triptych Epitaphio per Garcia Lorca. October next, Scherchen is saying that he's very disappointed that he couldn't cut the portion that he had suggested also because the orchestra didn't want them uh, to didn't want that cut they have to do with the third piece of Espana and el corazon first and third portion of the second piece of lorca and uh, and uh, he's saying that he's almost tired of stepping in and interfering in everybody else's work, but I should have insisted on those cuts. So in two following letters, Scherchen will ask the feedback from Nono, and uh, Nono will never reply. Scherchen is almost concluding this issue, November 1, 1957. I'm translating a small piece. I cannot try try to fix what it looks to me completely unresolved against the will of the composer. Art for me, Sergeant says in German, art is something even more important than what it is myself for my inner self. So how can we possibly frame then and define this shape of collaboration between composer and conductor? Well, there are some 
elements that uh, we can understand. That very relationship uh, had started off uh, through apprenticeship and that it had become uh, a free collaboration. There had been engagement and sharing. Still, that collaboration was always following a very precise conductor's line that would go from from conductor to composer and the other way around. At the very beginning, that straight line had been enriched by by some authority, authoritative position that had been taken by Scherchen. But also no no had some had, had some reaction to it. That very line was stemming, was originating from the choice not to share the creative responsibility. And uh, it was even strengthened uh, by a gradual uh, awareness of Nono, where Sheshen is recognizing that he, he has been, to some extent, somehow useful. And that is a letter that is uh, dating 11 February 1958. This progressive uh, emancipation by Nono is indeed uh, Moderna. His collaboration went on until 1965, um, connected in particular but not exclusively to the compositions in the catalog. A intolleranza 1960. Ad anni di distanza dalla morte di Maderna, stemperato probabilmente anche un momento di distacco ideologico da parte di Nono, sarà costante il richiamo di questi a Maderna alla volta degli anni Ottanta evidenziando l'importanza dell'amico, maestro e iniziatore di un'originalissima, cito, formazione di base metodologica, condotta secondo un metodo di studio comparativo che, cito sempre, che mi ha aiutato, dirà Nono, ad allargare sempre di più i miei interessi e i campi di studio. Bruno Maderna mi ha insegnato a pensare, aggiungerà Nono negli ultimi anni, quasi riscoprendo la presenza del pensiero musicale di Maderna alla base dell'ultima sua produzione. Il fondamento di questa comunione di umanità e logica, come Maderna dirà Nono nel maggio 1952, sempre basata sul riconoscimento della presenza di due personalità fortissime, di un'idea altrettanto forte di autorialità, percorre e irraggia tutti gli anni 50, da compositore a compositore, e fa dire a Maderna che, vi cito, abbiamo per la prima volta, credo, creato una sensibilità ambivalente, una tecnica comune, non personalità comune. La prospettiva dell'interazione tra i due compositori è dunque subito attiva e si spinge ancora oltre, quasi in un rapporto fraterno di chi condivide una collaborazione a lungo termine, se non addirittura un'esperienza fondamentale di vita insieme. Facendo dire a Maderna Nono, agli inizi del 1953, tu sei e rimani sempre il mio alter ego e anche la mia migliore pars. E fa dire di una strada trovata insieme, così Maderna, l'11 marzo 1955, la nostra strada, la nostra legittima strada. Come approcciare allora su queste istanze quella parte del rapporto tra i due che interessa Nono compositore e Maderna in quanto direttore della musica di Nono? Un punto di vista privilegiato è dato proprio dall'esperienza di intolleranza 1960 e dal fondamentale ruolo ricoperto da Maderna a fianco e in totale sinergia con Nono. Forse l'unico collaboratore all'interno della produzione dell'opera a, re a realizzare quella vera unione dichiarata da Nono e da lui pretesa e mai raggiunta con Angelo Maria Ripellino e con altri collaboratori come si vede proprio in una lettera a Ripellino del giugno 1960. Una vera unione, possiamo chiosare, sempre misurata dal compositore a partire dalla sua idea, cioè di Nono, la sola e unica e riducibile idea di concezione dell'opera, al punto che, come è stato studiato, del testo originale di Intolleranza 1960 di Ripellino, riscritto e ripensato per intero da Nono, non resterà che un'idea, o appunto da un'idea, di Angelo Maria Ripellino, come recita la dicitura sul testo della partitura. In questo contesto Maderna non solo è un fedele facilitatore della situazione da un punto di vista gestionale, comunicativo e organizzativo, come comprovano la maggior parte degli scambi di lavoro tra la fine del 1960 e il 1961, si dia uno sguardo a questi stralci, ponendosi totalmente al servizio dell'opera altrui, cioè di non, e come questi l'avrebbe realizzata, Maderna arriva ad agire sul piano creativo della concezione dell'opera. 
Si vede ad esempio, come è stato studiato da Angela Ida de Benedictis, la scena di tortura, di intolleranza, originariamente prevista da Ripellino nella seconda parte dell'opera, poi confluita nella prima parte, scena quarta. Si osservino le annotazioni di Pugno di Maderna stratificarsi ad altre di nono, presenti sul datiro scritto, versione definitiva di Ripellino. Prima dell'intervento corale, bordato da nono, Maderna annota un musica fortissimo e poi a piedi pagina, conclusione, si appunta alla fine. And then in conclusion you have uh, an obstinate type of music and you have the choir, the light and the service indication suggested to Nono and uh, you have some 40 uh, bars from Canto Sospeso as indicated by the Benedictus and immediately after that is the following page of this uh, typewritten text, uh, another note uh, on the scenic presence and musical presence of the choir. You have to uh, set out the choir as if uh, it was uh, a uh, directing rehearsal and immediately after only music from the creative uh, uh, interaction plan to the uh, carrying out of Nono's idea Maderna as a conductor is appreciated uh, as to the parts of the choirs on the opening of the second half of Intoleranza seen first. Uh, Uh, this tape uh, at the Studio di Fonologia di Milano of Rai was being made 11 days before the opening at Le Fenice, as you can see from a Moderna's letter, April 2, 1961, as to the edit in Milan and then in Cologne for the following year. Um, we may talk in this particular case to something that uh, comes from an unconditional and blind trust by Moderna and and also the fact that Moderna has perfectly understood this work, the true union, as we were saying before. I cannot find a better uh, description. That is, it's a kind of top delegation, um, and uh, this is uh, based upon this interaction and artistic alter ego relationship based upon the sharing the responsibility or part of the responsibility of creation, both vis-a-vis -vis phases, uh, in, indeed, uh, Uh, entailing whatever has been uh, typewritten by Ripellino vis-à-vis -vis, uh, their practical uh, carrying out, that is, uh, the edit of the tape uh, by keeping, of course, uh, uh, the same question on who's the author of, which, of what. Claudio Abbado uh, meets Nono at the Biennale in Venice in 1965, the same year in which, uh, for the last time, Maderna, together with Nono, conducted Intoleranza 1960 in Boston. Over the, during the last years of his life, Abbado will go back uh, to the first and earlier production at La Scala with Nono, with Gigi and Maurizio. We don't talk a lot, as he says, in the documentary by Bettina Herert. Indeed, um, this uh, statement is not just a joke or an expedient of uh, fiction, but it is indeed uh, substantiated by documents and letters by Nono himself. In these documents, uh, there is uh, the image of a long-lasting friendship, although with intermittent meetings, inevitably so, based upon a communication that more than talking about music is based on making music, uh, that is, something uh, whose essence and depth uh, uh, is based on sharing a vision, although with no verbal communication before actually trying to examine the form of collaboration between Nono and Abado for 25 years and consolidate it until the last minute. I'd like to recall very quickly some of the themes that we have addressed already within the framework of uh, contemporary research uh, with some key words that is commitment and listening or in silence as well. I'd like to uh, limit these categories through the um, uh, quotations of both musicians, uh, also because uh, uh, we do not have to hand in to the idée uh, reçue, uh, although they're legitimate and respectable. Uh, there is the theme of the commitment, certainly politic-wise. Uh, pol Abado says, especially in the year 2000, it is a moment we need to uh, think about, for instance, uh, 
the meetings in Reggio Emilia for Musica in Realtà. Music has its own value. Politics uh, has nothing whatsoever to do with it, as Abado says when interviewed by Gaston Fournier Fascio. In actuality, the, uh, this factor can be um, define as something which is closely connected to, to look for whatever is new. And when Abardo talks about Simone Boccanegra for the opening uh, in 71-72 at, uh, at La Scala, and I quote, in all Verdi there's always a need of researching for something new and revolutionary, says Abardo, with explicit reference to the famous scene of the Major Consiglio at the unforgettable moment when the witchcraft by Simone on par Albiani. You always have to find something new. Um, that's uh, the idea of Camirantes, as about many years later will say. There is a problem of listening and other possibilities of listening. This was a theme by Nono in the 80s, over and beyond titles and words, uh, um, often used uh, as a backlash by uh, third parties, and, and also because of the uh, concentration of mutual correspondences uh, um, are revealed through the presence of other ways of listening to this repertoire, and we have different cornerstones here. We have some here which are very meaningful. It is Nono himself who says to Abado in 1968 to have a new Don Carlos for La Scala together with him. And um, 20 years later, it seems to go back to this uh, old memory uh, while listening to Kovacina. Uh, these cornerstones from the end of the 70s onward converge often towards Mahler's music. Uh, the closeness with Mahler uh, strengthens uh, a connection from the Canto Sospeso, and you have Prometheus. And this is not just an artistic operation uh, w which stemmed from the 90s by a bad post-mortem. No, no. Um, indeed, says um, that it belongs to both. Uh, uh, and so, Rostagno interviewed No, no. Some of the uh, excerpts are dedicated to introduction of the Sixth Symphony of Mahler. Um, um, there is always a, a proximity relationship uh, with the first uh, symphony by Mahler in the idea of looking for a primordial sound uh, so that you can find yourself inside it all of a sudden from nothing, as at the beginning of uh, Symphony Number no. One by Mahler, uh, what Nono has in mind is naturally the Abado's Mahler. Uh, but um, Abado, during the years of La Scala, is indeed uh, the um, author of some openings, such as Como una ola de fuerza y luz and Al gran sole carica d'amore. And there is a social space, and Abado himself connects not to Mahler in the 90s. Uh, the theme of the problem of silence, that is a certain quality of pauses uh, and crowns, as in the Prometheus, uh, the recording to about him himself is already prefigured in the finale of the Ninth Symphony by Mahler. The silence at the end of the piece is a participation of the audience to the performance, says uh, in the documentary Magia dei Suoni Abado. And then I quote, uh, people in general uh, fear silence. Mm, uh, the uh, mahler nono abado relationship uh, turns out uh, to be um, uh, tense and uh, um, uh, indeed uh, pulled by both uh, ends of the rope. Uh, and I use Nono's words, uh, there is a non-going and unreplaceable uh, creative actions. In the previous slides, uh, you have read uh, recurrent uh, phrases by Nono, true uh, creative fantasy, solitude, um, uh, so filled and joyous of creative life, a human journey and a creative journey, innovating and creating what has never been done before. But, uh, what does it mean when we talk about uh, a creative action when a composer talks to a performer? We have to recompose the two elements, that is, commitment, intermediation of whatever is new, the problem of uh, um, uh, the analytical approach to the uh, work, um, um, faith to the score, and I quote, personal intention, the idea of an interpretation as a perennial work in progress, instinctive 
curiosity um, uh, to for the other uh, and I quote Oreste Bossini. Maurizio Pollini said uh, there is a process of clarification in the conducting art by Abado in constant evolution. And I say uh, it's a research to explicit something which uh, to a certain extent had remained implicit, that is, to get closer to a piece, to create, to get closer to things. It is very likely that as a methodology of work, this process of clarifying what has not been expressed, that is a rational approach to written music, can be seen also in the initial moment and fundamental part of the study of the score and memorization. More than um, examining the so-called diagrams, it can be useful um, to study the scores. And of course, diagrams are connected to that. Let's go and review the first page of the diagram of the Canto Sospeso. Um, uh, Giovanni Cestino has um, uh, approached it uh, for a long time yesterday. And uh, right after the, uh, the magnification of one of his fragments related to the section 6B of Canto Sospeso, with all the bars related to it. We see the segmentation of the Tachtengruppen and the elements, uh, the salient element highlighted in, on the score, and then on the diagram with the plan of dynamics of tempos and, and uh, uh, sounds and elements. Uh, or, and uh, uh, showing to you this, I'd like to specify that this is a certainly the rational image of mu analytical music music in, in the relative sense of the study by Abado, and we may mean all this as a residual waste or minimum waste of the clarification process, uh, which in its own intimate essence we can leave and build up from rehearsal to rehearsal. And we have to look at these documents as traces of a process which lives and resides particularly in the performing action, as we may see even better. Then there is a last aspect. Uh, I'd like to conclude and allows us to um, understand even better the collaboration between Nono and Abado. Let's think about the last quotation on Prometheus when Nono writes to Abado uh, in Milan it's fundamental to have uh, rehearsals all together orchestra, choir, solos technique to work together and not to glue. Let's indulge on, on some uh, rehearsals by um, uh, or in performances um, uh, of Nono's uh, work uh, the Grand Sole, 1978, in this theatre. And Nono writes uh, to Abado on this letter in 1977. Let's pay attention to the actions on dynamics and adds on uh, by Nono to Abado and all the little changes adopted on dynamics, um, following, of course, rethinking, but as we have seen over the past few slides, rehearsing together and building up a collective work also during rehearsals. Let's go back to uh, a further performance of Prometheus. And uh, you have in Berlin the photocopies of the manuscript by Nono, and Albado uh, conducted uh, this performance at La Scala. Nono got these photocopies to Albado uh, in different files, section by section, mm, before they were being handed over to uh, the publisher Ricordi. Uh, the uh, clustering of photocopies into files corresponds to the form of the attachment that Nono would uh, send uh, to the conductor uh, once uh, copied and finished. So Nono mails uh, bits by bits uh, the score to Abado with some of the parts interlude, uh, sketch done, or maybe to be integrated thanks to the discussion by Abado and what was being rehearsed with some other parts to be copied and to be photocopied for Abado, whilst other parts of the manuscript already received by Abado would be indeed uh, sent back to Nono in some cases. These notes in the initial phase before uh, the opening of Prometheus in Venice, you see, to be copied for Claudio, and please give me the original back. Or even these others um, uh, uh, from the uh, cover of Interludio Primo, uh, probably to an interlocutor at Ricordi, where you read photocopy and return manuscript. I'm going to be in Pesaro to go through the score with Claudio Abado. Is it possible to get everything photocopied? Copia to Claudio Abado, copy, copy to me and others. 
uh, in the light of these uh, uh, images, this process of clarification, the clarification that we were mentioning before, where does it begin from and where does it end? And uh, who is inducing it and acting it with a bad that there is a meaningful involvement when it comes to uh, indeed um, um, carrying out ideas, not as much as in the case of Moderna thinking about intolerance, uh, making ideas come true also in terms of research and validation by non. We might say better reorienting those ideas or new orientation for those ideas. It's not by chance that it intensifies when his theatrical works are being re-performed again. And the operation of the three instrumental suites, Intoleranza, Framenti da Gran Sole, uh, that are later vis-a-vis -vis the opening at La Scala in 75, and post-mortem, the suite uh, from the Prometheus. Uh, uh, suites uh, that uh, are new performances uh, for a new context in terms of music and space. These are all operations over and beyond the practical reasons uh, that um, might uh, uh, be, um, you know, a part of it uh, can make them more um, um, uh, prone to be proposed uh, than the originals. Uh, given that Prometheus cannot be performed, uh, what's important is to maintain its special dimension. And I conclude, it is obvious that in this general function of intermediation by Abad or A is known or who, when uh, one of his works is being re-performed, uh, indeed uh, addresses or urges uh, first and foremost Bardo, uh, as a gigantic organizer at the top of the most important uh, musical institutions where he um, wants to perform Don Carlos Viaggio a Reims Convention, um, which uh, played a role in Nono and uh, played an impact on Rolo. And based on this, we may understand Nono's words to Paolo Grassi in 1977. Claudio is really a creative intelligence, a new perspective, uh, a brand new one and a big impulse. Uh, I believe this is an intelligence which expressed itself in the form of this intermediation, which went on and on, also orienting and reorienting Nono, and at the same time inducing and uh, triggering this clarification process in a circular development between composer and conductor, so that you would have uh, uh, the best possible way of perfecting both the form and the conception of the work imagined by the composer. Thank you very much indeed. Grazie, Michele. Thank you, Michele Capine, for this very rich presentation, rich with input, information, details say uh, it, it, it looked like a kaleidoscope movement around three composers three generations of conductors as well we uh, we range we shift from an, a very authoritative role down to down to the person guiding uh, and of course uh, to the to the uh, to the one that you may really collaborate with so there's one point that hasn't been touched based upon due to time constraint, and, and that has to do, and that has to do with something, uh, um, with something very specific. When you mention Cherchen and Nono relationship, uh, when the first uh, wanted to impose uh, some cuts, and uh, Nono was very disappointing on on that. And uh, also, Nono would have never, would have never wanted to to group uh, his works in suites. And the only person who was able to do so um, was actually Claudio Abado. And I would like to uh, remind everybody that uh, this was also something that I debated myself around with Claudio Abado around the possibility of donating 
the opera in a different shape with respect to the one the composer himself. Uh, he would have a uh, love uh, to, uh, let's say, to, to, to share it. And, uh, and I remember that uh, Abaro's answer used to say that it was not about rejecting uh, from composer's point of view, uh, but actually he gave this enlightening answer. And that was saying that it was a very, very uh, difficult, uh, um, it was very difficult to still get across the difficulty of the shape and still being able to get across the original sense of the composer. And uh, he's to say, if I ask for a full Prometheo uh, to be played, they will say that this is not possible. So sweet is the best tool I have to still get across these sounds. I, I remember I was very doubtful uh, about this, but actually, let me say that indeed, this answer includes this strong willingness uh, of actually delivering, donating a sound content, perhaps in a slightly different shape, still fully respectful, of course, of the composer's efforts. Uh, Yes, indeed, that's very that's very true. And if we take the suite from uh, Prometheo, it seems to also to um, to to say even more about it because the opera was uh, being communicated to uh, to the composer by partitions by, and that that was for practical reason. But uh, meanwhile, he would feed this a uh, kind of a circular process of clarification as well. So this form of collaboration that would make the opera available in a kind of a selective form, and uh, so. This is why we explore the collaboration and then uh, the form that, uh, uh, that Abado adopted uh, later on. So uh, reproducing, delivering, donating opera, uh, let's say, in kind of episodes. So I was doubtful between this, so either deliver it, this shape or not delivering that at all, I think it is still makes sense to play it, whatever the shape, whatever the cuts that are being made. Um, are there questions or doubt or any curiosity that I was bringing in anybody's mind before we move forward? Okay, so there are no questions. Thank you so much, Michele. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your rich presentation. I would invite Marco Stroppa to actually uh, take us by the hand towards the hand of this morning session, very intense morning session. When, as I was saying earlier on, when I started to research into the correspondence letters uh, of Luigi Nono many years ago, I was not familiar with music. I was not familiar with Marco Stroppa. That was at the, the end of 90s. And I remember these incredible letters from Nono to Abado where the first, it was recommended on top of uh, popular uh, composers, it would also recommend the name of young composers, and Marco Stroppa was amongst these. Uh, and he was the most cited one, actually, the, 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 the most frequently mentioned. So I am so particularly happy to close the morning session with Marco. Marco, you have the floor. I'm sorry, I noticed that I will be the only person this morning speaking scusa, English, io, scusa. <laughs> but I, my Italian, formal Italian is still a bit rusted and I have to come more often to Italy to improve it. And, uh, and I would prefer, I would feel more comfortable to talk in English. <clears throat> I started to compose when I was around 22. But during the first 10 years of my activity, I wrote only four pieces, which is very little for a composer normally, since for each piece, I wanted to delve into the deep secret roots of my soul and challenge my inspiration. So when I met Claudio Abado, 
I was less than 10 years old as a composer. That artistic and human experience with him was, however, similar in terms of intensity and long-standing effects to the beginning of Richard Strauss' Also Spracht Zarathustra. Imagine a young composer whose first piece, Metabolai, written while he was still studying in the city's conservatory with Azio Corgi, is performed in a sold-out theater together with one of Luciano Berrio's most intriguing and expressing works, Requies, and within an incredibly imaginative program. At that time, Abado had just been awarded an honorary degree by the University of Ferrara and pronounced the following words. In this world where so many people talk and talk and so few know how to listen, one just needs to leave the door open to music. Even contemporary music, even the music of fairy tales that that elf Benigni animates and improvises. I still very well remember how he immediately made me contact with him very easily so, and very natural, in, a, in spite of a working schedule which was booked from breakfast to late night. I also managed to ask him about his experience with Luigi Nono's Prometeo because I was curious about how he could communicate with performers that were so far apart and in three dimensions, in three different heights. This short discussion sharpened my awareness about how to integrate space into my own compositions and in an organic and cogent way. I had already realized that space is, for a composer, a weak dimension. For weak, I mean, to use an analogy, that a great space will not suffice to turn bad music into great art, and the other way around, of course. More formally, and to borrow a concept from the American cognitive psychologist Stephen McAdams, space cannot be a form-bearing element of music. However, I was convinced that if I could find a compelling interaction between some spatial properties and stronger musical dimensions, so that each one reinforces the others, I could attain a kind of perceptive nirvana. I will show some examples in a few minutes. I don't expect that you reach the nirvana in this space, but still imagine my wish. Moreover, when talking about space in a physical space, I say not about the several metaphorical spaces that are incredibly important and fascinating as we saw this morning, one usually refers to the acoustic characteristics of a whole, which can be measured and simulated in programs like Altiverb. After having explored immersive spaces in two early works with electronics of mine, I had the intuition that I ought to shift my attention from the whole to the emitter of sound, which is called a source. A source is characterized by its radiating properties, how it sends sound away from it, its location on the stage, in the hall, outside, its distance from the listener, and its orientation. One might not know that, for example, a basset horn radiates sound in an extremely complex way. In this picture, uh, the radiating patterns for several spectral regions of a single note, the F below middle C, are shown. We are not used to listening to this dimension analytically. We should closely turn around the instrument while the sound is emitted to perceive it and have a good spectral ear. But we find the sound of an instrument natural and rich. In comparison, a loudspeaker's radiation patterns are terribly dull. I will go back to this point at the end of my presentation. Finally, in order to integrate the characteristics of a source into a composition, I had to imagine a spatial dramaturgy that would cooperate with the dramaturgy of the form according to several criteria I will not uh, analyze today. Let me be more concrete with the help of four of my works. The first example is an excerpt from Gladia, 
Here, the main attention is placed, placed on different positions of the bells of the horns with respect to each other. Usually, the bell of a horn is hidden because it is directed toward the rear right of the bodies of the player. As a consequence, we usually perceive only an indirect sound. In Gladia, however, the bell is the main focus. If we look at the position of the horns in the first movement, two opposite patterns appear. The front instrument's bell is directed towards the back of the stage, and the bell of the second performer, behind, is directed towards the audience. The bodies, of course, have to be placed accordingly. What kind of music can make this configuration sound? I imagine a dialectical interplay between a percussive, obsessive pulse sound, technically a tongue slap, and other figures based on glissandi and short notes. When the slap passes from one instrument to the other, a clear change of radiation is perceived. The sound is coming from the performer placed behind the front one, but comes more directly. Here is a very short excerpt of the beginning of the first movement. No sound. E non c'è suono. C'è una dimensione psicologica perché eh, il corno in fronte praticamente butta il suono nella uh, campana e c'è una reazione, un cambiamento di prospettiva uh, quando c'è la pulsazione di una figura da una campana all'altra. C'è un'ulteriore esplorazione delle caratteristiche radianti degli strumenti si trovano in Ossia, un trio ispirato da due poesie di Josef Brodsky. Eh, Ossia è il diminutivo, cioè il nomignolo. Nella set, nelle sette parti di questo lavoro c'è una fonte fissa, il pianoforte che è al centro del palcoscenico e conversa con tutta una serie di fonti mobili, violino e, vi e viole che sono in altre parti della uh, zona, ci sono drammaturgie spaziali e la composizione eccita uh, le caratteristiche spaziali salienti di o ciascuna configurazione data, ad esempio is a long and expressive melody only based on the natural harmonics of the cello, which is little by little accompanied by a violin hidden behind the piano's open lid. The piano cannot play since it is well-tempered and it would not match the natural tuning of the cello.
In the second movement, after a short piano solo, whose main function is to give the violin the time to discreetly walk to the front of the stage, none of the violin or the cello never play while moving. Ideally, if they could just teleport themselves, it would be better, but the technology is not ready yet. The spatial configuration displays a vertical line from the violin in front to the cello in the same place as the first movement through the piano within a brisk and rhythmical musical character. It is the cello now that has the role of accompanying the violin through the piano. Finally, in the third part, violin and cello become a unique indirect sound source. They are oriented with their back to the audience and play homorhythmic music as loud as possible in spite of a heavy lead mute. This produces the psychological effect of a choked scream, reinforced by the indirect perception, the people don't see that the mute is on, and by the compositional materials that are being used. A very quick, mellow and fleeting texture in the piano, punctuated by some sharp accents to create the connection to the compact, heavy and tense sound boulders in the strings. that loudspeakers cannot match the complexity of the radiation of acoustic instruments. However, the trumpet and the trombone, because of the directional characteristics of their bell, are perhaps those which most closely approximate a loudspeaker. I apologize for trumpet and trombone players, they are not loudspeakers, but they are closer to it. I use these features in I Will Not Kiss Your Fucking Flag, based on an anti-war poem by E.E. E. Cummings. Here, a trombone evolves within a continuous frontal space. The interaction between the acoustic trombone, the amplified trombone, and the electronic sounds generates different spatial configurations. For example, at the beginning of the piece, the trombone is placed between two loudspeakers in the center of the stage, since it plays with a stopped whore mute, 
It sounds like a hybrid instrument somewhere between horn and trombone. The two loudspeakers not only amplify it, but also enlarge its image as though they were an extension of the bell, an acoustic extension of the bell. The electronics comes out of the same source and therefore generates a very concentrated spatial image. The second movement generates a totally different spatial image, which is based on a cognitive dissonance between the ear and the eye. The trombonist is placed on the rear right side of the stage and plays with a silent brass mute. The direct sound is so soft that it cannot be perceived by, audience, by the audience, actually not even by the performer, him or herself. They're using earphones to hear themselves. Its amplification, however, is projected from a loudspeaker placed diagonally opposite to the trombone. A virtual diagonal space emerges between the place where the performer is seen and the place where he or she is heard. This diagonal is filled by electronic sounds that are quite close to the trombone's sound and constantly move from and in front, the front to the rear. The whole atmosphere is very intimate, almost demure. This intimacy is reinforced by the usage of some special fingerings in the trombone and by some processing added to its sound that I will not discuss here. The final result sounds like this. of electronic sounds are concrete and visible presence while being able to produce more complex and dynamic radiation patterns, I have been developing for 15 years the concept of acoustic totem, a collection of loudspeakers placed near each other which represent a single sound source. Starting from Off Silence 2007 for saxophone and chamber electronics, I have developed so far seven families of totems. The last one embodies the role of the soloist of the first concerto for solo electronics and orchestra that I know. Mine, I mean. It was not written before, it was written a concerto for synthesizer and orchestra, but not for electronic solo and acoustic totem. The visual charisma of acoustic totems confers to them a very strong dramatic role. They project sound around themselves according to entirely composed patterns that interact with the walls around them and the hall in which they play and produce an effect that is unique and cannot be approximated by 
existing immersive systems based on large collection of loudspeakers. It is therefore not an accident that an acoustic totem plays a crucial role in my opera Reorso, based on a text by Arrigo Boito. During most of the piece, invisible voices and sounds are projected through a frontal system in order to fuse with the space defined by the orchestra in the pit. At the most crucial moment, however, just before the last scene, the main character, a wicked king countertenor, Rodrigo Ferreira in the premiere, dies. Well, it's normal in operas that people die, isn't it? Actually, not only does he die, but his voice dies too. So, what does it mean to kill a voice without killing the person, of course? Through a huge glissando from a high D, D is Re in Italian, which means king, the voice progressively descends into hell, and during this process turns itself into a tolling bell, something that only the electronics can produce. In the stage direction by Richard Brunella, the Opera Comique, all the elements related to the king also collapse. At the same time, an acoustic totem emerges. The picture is relatively dark, or the scene is dark, but you get maybe the impression it is in the center of the stage. Uh, and because this acoustic totem role is related to the main female character, a verme, a worm, in the opera, who is a woman of the people and was Monica Bacelli in the premiere, who survives the death of the king and sings the last scene. The change in spatial characteristics is dramatic. From a frontal sound projection to an acoustic totem, which projects its sounds around the stage in three dimensions, giving its height, its eight loudspeakers. This is not only the dramaturgic climax of the opera, but also its spatial climax. Again, space and music are bound together to reinforce each other and attain, if possible, this nirvana. I propose to hear a small uh, moment of this, uh, exactly the moment where the voice of the king dies.
mentioned at the beginning that space is a weak dimension of music. Those who wish to go deeper into this aspect may refer to some essays I wrote or some that I will still write. I believe I gave the demonstration of this concert by playing some experts where the composition of space that I discussed could not be recorded, yet the purpose was, I hope, clear. This is one of the essential characteristics of the exploration of the source of space. It can only be experienced live, during a concert, in a hall. It is and will be impossible to express it even with the most sophisticated tools of virtual reality. And because of a scientific reason, not a technological impeachment. In a world that is becoming increasingly more virtual, let me please end this communication by pleading for the importance of human interactions between physically present beings and not faces or names in squares on a computer screen. When Claudio Abbado was crowned by the International Intercultura Award during the intermission of the concert in Ferrara, the reason was his work for his work in bringing young people from all over the world together. The concert, not only intended in a traditional way and not only limited to the time of the performers, the concert as an artistic and social event, as a way to imagine different worlds where people meet and share emotions, images, memories, feelings, sensations, thoughts, is one of the ways to achieve this goal, and to my opinion, one of Claudio Abbado's greatest lessons. Vorrei terminare in italiano eh, per associarmi ai miei colleghi nel ringraziare il Comitato Scientifico. I would love to conclude in Italian and I would love uh, to express my gratitude to the scientific committee for making this event possible. I'd love to thank those people who are perhaps less visible but not least important who have uh, contributed to the organization so they, uh, they, they were able to actually make uh, sound possible to be had in this very complicated venue and also all the people who helped me in organizing my presentation today. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. And thanks to the invisible ones as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marco, for uh, giving us this uh, very unique perspective uh, framed a, by, a, by a composer. We were actually able to close a circle, if you will. We started to tackle space associated to Abado, listening to musicians who have worked with him. And then we went through a different perspective, which is more musicology associated, so musicologist approach, if you will, and then the composer's approach in the end. So we uh, literally uh, went around this whole concept uh, thanks uh, to different seeds that we that, that were sowed. And uh, finally coming to a seed which is almost uh, independent from a collaboration, but it, it may start off from a meeting, from an initial collaboration that might, might have impacted you as an individual and as a composer. And back to what you said in your in your speech so the need to experience a sound in live fashion and that brings us back to what we said yesterday as well when we uh, when we spoke uh, about uh, um, uh, fixing adjusting the acoustics uh, when you want to record uh, uh, for instance uh, in a and have a recorded track on a DVD and uh, and different uh, support um, so during the session uh, yesterday, we realized that what were the huge efforts that Abad would still make for his recorded work uh, to still be fully appreciated. And we appreciated his, his approach on that. And I, I understand, I would reckon that that is also a very, uh, a very dear topic to yourself, right? Uh, yeah, can you, yeah, I mean, if I may answer, of course, of course you can. 
Well, this is something that I've been struggling with uh, uh, within myself, actually, because uh, first and foremost, you must have clear ideas before you can come up with some technology solutions. Uh, so if you're not in a concert hall, how can you make this music be heard? Uh, um, so you had some of the recordings uh, of the of the live, so there were a live recording, whereas the CD is something that stays there. After long discussions and debates that I had in the past, we decided not to record the space and just having those three musicians kind of sitting still and not really moving because we were rehearsing, positioning, placing microphones in the right position and then working on a post production fashion as well. But if you don't see what you hear, it doesn't work anymore. And it really sounds like bad music. It's almost embarrassing. Um, so we may accept to listen to instrumental music being recorded uh, because we do, we've do. we actually gained enough experience uh, about what an orchestra is, or what a, a violin, uh, what a piano players make during a concert. Well, the minute you actually allow electronics to step in and uh, if there's no space radiation made possible. Unfortunately, I still have no solutions for that. And I'm happy to welcome uh, um, open ears and eyes uh, to, to, to welcome solutions from anybody. So my piece of advice would be to go and see concert and hear concert. Well, so far, I'm happy like this. Uh, perhaps there will be less people uh, and, and less concert in the future. But this is uh, enough so far. This is something that I had spoken about with uh, Luigi Nono. And uh, and they say, well, you build the ark, but then who's coming to to listen to you in the ark? And also, it may get rotten after a while because of the wood nature itself. And the, his answer was, uh, well, because uh, I just wanted to do something unique, and I wanted people to appreciate this very one of a kind event in a, in, a, in such a unique venue. And uh, well. Let me say the others uh, will just refer back to what is existing already, and uh, well, in the end, if we take uh, um, if we take if we take a look at the past, uh, there are so many one of a kind uh, events and solutions that have been adopted by artists in the past. Uh, but I was not necessarily in agreement with him, and actually, that allows me to add a small piece uh, on the Arc, which we spoke about. So, Arc was established for a very specific venue for San Lorenzo, so the shape itself of the Arc uh, would had been uh, had been conceived uh, to strengthen the acoustic in that venue, which was already uh, fairly unique. Um, but because you mentioned the arc, which uh, brings us back to the collaboration and uh, everything we've spoken about so far, I'd love to take the opportunity at this point to thank all the speakers from the morning session. And thank you so much you answered in Italian, because we're being reassured that you can still speak uh, 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 great Italian and you haven't lost uh, any any Italian language. We started with Eva Maria Tomasi. She spoke in Italian. She's German, and uh, and uh, we are ending with yourself. Uh, so. This shows clearly what is the evolution of our current society as well. You have lived abroad for many years, uh, and when that is the case, uh, you realize that there's no language that you can speak properly if you travel a lot, if you happen to travel a lot. So Eva, Eva Maria Tomasi, uh, Francesca Borani, and Ciel uh, Agugliaro, although it's not here, Michele Chiappini, Elena Abbado, and Marco Stroppa uh, for presenting this morning. We actually we are actually sticking to time uh, perfectly. Perhaps uh, it, we were very much afraid that we couldn't make it time-wise, and perhaps my colleagues were, uh, were felt that they were threatened for time. I think we now all deserve. Of, uh, a, a lunch break, as well as perhaps a glass of wine uh, for a beautiful toast. And we're resuming this afternoon uh, for the afternoon session. Roundtable will be moderated by Reste Fossini, and it will be fully devoted uh, to the future. Great opening towards the future. And we will kind of draw a line and a, a, a kind of close the loop and see 
how all of these teachings we've had uh, so far, uh, how can we translate that into a bright future? Thank you so much, and we're resuming three o'clock. So it was a such a great and dense contribution which has provided us with lots of uh, interesting inputs uh, so from Renzo Piano. So we're now starting our last session for this conference. So this last afternoon session, I think it has been magnific magnificently introduced by Renzo Piano. What makes us alive is not so much what we've done in the past, but what we still have to do in the future. And this very last session devoted to Claudio Abbado means to resume this uh, bottom line idea um, and that is the following. So what makes uh, Claudio Abado's role still very much alive is, is what he had taught us to be and to see in our present. So, and that is uh, to dream, to imagine, to be able to project into the future our utopia, our aspirations, uh, our wish to potentially have a new music, a new cultural institutions, uh, to have an overall renovation uh, uh, of a cultural and music life. So, and that was the wishful thinking of uh, Claudio Bardo, something that we wanted to emphasize in this conference in these past two days. And hopefully you have been able to appreciate that it, it was not meant to be a celebration event. Uh, per se, but actually we just wanted to emphasize the key creative aspects from him. He's been a, a, such a great performer, but also at the same time a, a creative personality capable to introduce uh, innovation, always something new. And indeed, we've taken on a challenge. Uh, whilst we were organising this event, it, it is not uh, it's not so easy to devote a full conference to a conductor. It is way easier to do that with a composer or with an author, uh, because uh, let's say the um, of course our vision is uh, is usually uh, is usually there to reproduce perhaps what it's been created from with a creative. Um, methodology, but actually we have been able to appreciate both yesterday and today, so we've been able to appreciate uh, in the ability of Claudio Bardo to actually mingle, to actually blend the two things together, both in creation and in performing, and we've gathered uh, many different perspectives and point of views uh, in this past few days, in this past two days. So this last afternoon session means to devote some time to perhaps a cast a new glance and look on what we can do now to build the future. And, and this is how we call this last portion of the afternoon. First and foremost, I'd love to say hello and thank our guests. 
Andrea Sichman. She is the intendant from Berliner Philharmonica, and we are honored to have her here. Georg Koch, uh, he comes from Germany, but is also uh, half Italian, if you will, because he has lived in Italy now for, for many years. He's been living in Italy for a few years now, and he teaches in Milan. Maria Maino, she doesn't need to be introduced here in La Scala, uh, but uh, she's had, a, she's covered important roles uh, in music organization, both in Milan and elsewhere. She's currently uh, she's currently uh, taking care of uh, Sistema Europa and uh, um, working in Lombardy mainly, but we'll hear more uh, soon. And um, Emmanuel André from Cité de la Musique, Philharmonie de Paris. And uh, this is a great music activity, uh, very broad, I should say, 360 degrees, and, uh, and we'll get the chance uh, again to deep dive further in a moment. And Marco Ferullo, his spokesperson, uh, speaking on behalf of Philharmonica della Scala, thank you so much for being here with us today. And he represents a kind of an important slice, if you will, out of the legacy from a from Claudio Bardo's lesson when it comes to uh, our uh, music life here in Milan. So I am so very glad actually to welcome these guests with me on stage. So thank you so much for uh, accepting our invite. And not only those who are with me this afternoon, but also, of course, guests this mo from this morning and from yesterday. So these people were traveling from Berlin, from Vienna, uh, from uh, uh, from London. Unfortunately, Sid uh, could not not come for health issue, uh, but he he was about to travel as well. Um, but this it, it was important for us to have people as much as possible in person here because we want to be able to talk through Claudio Abado and his European dimension uh, because there's a big difference uh, between delivering Italian excellence throughout Europe or actually having a, a broad European thinking and, and that is a big big difference uh, and actually Abado was a great performance conductor who, who could have this European thinking. Um, I'd love to start from Andrea Chichman. Uh, well, first of all, she has uh, worked uh, uh, very close to you with Claudia Bardo, so um, well before she became intendant uh, in the Berlin Philharmonica, and she has gained experience uh, in uh, Gustav Mahler Jugend Orchestra to start with, uh, and then a kind of a uh, professional uh, spin off uh, the Gustav Mahler Orchestra. So Andrea, if you could tell us a bit more about your experience gained with Abado and uh, this ability he had of working with young people. So his ability of founding, creating, establishing space music. This town, I was told to do that. <laughs> Buonasera a tutti e grazie per l'invito. Devo continuare in inglese, mi dispiace. Non posso parlare um, tutto il tempo in italiano. So thanks for this invitation and it's a big pleasure to be here. Um, I missed the day yesterday, so I hope I will not um, repeat things from, from yesterday. And we were all saying the speech of Renzo Piano was very impressive, very intense. So I think it was a fantastic um, statement to begin this session with. Um, if you can speak a little bit yes, slowly. Yes, more slowly, okay. The of course, yeah. So um, maybe just to give my personal background, um, what I experienced with Abado over the years, as you already said, I mean, there are different steps in my professional life where I met him. My first encounter was with the Gustav Mahler Youth Orchestra, where I worked for three years as touring manager. So I got this background. And then out from them, we, we um, founded the Mahler Chamber Orchestra. It was a group of musicians who wanted to stick together. So they didn't want to give up this idea of this fantastic experience. So we all sat together. And I personally, when I was in Edinburgh on tour with him at the Edinburgh Festival, I asked him, well, we want to found a new orchestra. Will you help us? 
And he said, yes, but you can do it yourself. I will contribute a little bit of money in the beginning. I will give you a residence in Ferrara, and the rest you have to do yourself. So we founded the Mala Chamber Orchestra, which I'm happy is still one of the most profiled chamber orchestra nowadays. And then in 2003, I had the great experience to kind of follow also the founding of Luzern Festival Orchestra. I mean, Claudio was very, very ill at that time. We, we gathered in Berlin and we developed the whole idea of the Luzern Festival Orchestra. And what was, of course, fantastic for Mala Chamber Orchestra, we decided that the MCO should be the noyau, so kind of the center of the Luzern Festival Orchestra, which was clever by Claudio because he knew there are 50 people who have been working together for many, many years, so he can add many individual players and will not lose any quality and, and uh, not the time. And during the time of the Mahler Chamber Orchestra, I decided to put the office um, in Berlin, knowing that he was music director of Berlin Philharmonic. So, of course, it was a nice coincidence, and I followed all these important years in Berlin, maybe just for my um, personal stories. And I think from what I learned when I first met him, I was only 24 years, one thing he told me, and I think this has sort of governed my whole professional life, is that you always have to go beyond the limits. You have never to accept a built-in ceiling. So you always have to sort of ask more and go, go for more. And I think that was a very driving factor also for building the Mahler Chamber Orchestra. I mean, looking what he has kind of given us on the path for the future, I think there are different aspects which are important and which are also the ground for me and the whole Berlin Philharmonic Foundation to take the right decisions nowadays. Um, one thing is this political and social engagement and responsibility. Um, as you all know, he did all these different projects to involve society, to involve young people, so it's a lot about music education. And I think even before Sir Simon Rattle started the education program, Claudio had sort of set all this before. When we were on tour, there were open general rehearsals, we did concerts for prisoners, we kind of always, every single city we were visiting, we were trying to build a big community program around it. I think that's one really, really important aspect. Um, then, of course, the educational program in, in principle, which he had always in mind. Then the real innovative look at everything we are doing in terms of programming, giving commissions, but doing also mad projects like the Pomet Hill was sort of a crazy, crazy project in every aspect. Um, like the Centre Pompidou was for, for Renzo Piano. So I think that was something which he always transported also to his, to his youth orchestra um, and all the musicians experienced that. And I think with also founding the different orchestras, starting with European Union Youth Orchestra, the Gustav Mahler Youth Orchestra, with a strong political message to reunify East and West. Then the founding of Chamber Orchestra of Europe and Mahler Chamber Orchestra and the Mozart Orchestra, he kind of renewed the whole musical scene because there were no freelance orchestras who were not subsidized. I mean, it was a really new thing that, that an orchestra was kind of going, coming together in one city and then going on tour, but without subventions, without regular income. So I think that was a big thing which lasts on until today because he encouraged ensembles like Ensemble Modern, Ensemble Intercontemporain, and all these, these um, freelance orchestra. I think that was a big, big thing. And talking maybe and giving some keynotes what we are kind of discussing and thinking about at the moment in Berlin, I think the, the Corona time was, a, of course, a difficult time, but it was, in a way, a serious and a very painful alarm clock for all of us. Because I can only speak, of course, for the political situation in Germany, but we had to realize what Lorenzo Borani told this morning, that culture and musical life is not in the heart of the society. And when everything was closed down and when there were the first steps to open up the, the social life, 
culture and also our concert halls, we were kind of always being last. And I can only tell you we were fighting like hell to make the first steps to get visibility, to get the audience in the halls. And I think we all have to realize, and that's probably true and valuable for whole Europe, that what we thought, the importance we think music and culture gives to people is not seen in a larger environment in, in society. And I think for me, this is the biggest challenge we have now to do really strong and great lobby work on, on one side with politicians, also of course people who are running, who are leaders in the economy, because there's a new generation of people coming in who have not grown up with classical music, not with culture, for them it's not natural to go to concerts. Um, that's one thing, and then of course we don't have to forget our audience. And of course, I mean with Berlin Philharmonic we have no problem to fill our concert halls. I mean, we are a global brand, so for us it's, it's rather easy, but I think the challenge is huge to broaden the audience um, and put also the audience in the center and, and really get more acceptance and more, how can you say that, well, at least a, a broader acceptance in society. And maybe we can talk later about programming. Of course, the key asset is, is how, how you position your concert hall, how you position the orchestra, how you do the community work. It's, there are many, many aspects which, which you have to follow and which you have to do really well to give answers to all these, these really um, difficult topics. And of course, every city, every institution has their own questions, um, how they connect, how the competition is in, all over. So um, maybe we can deepen in later, but uh, what I, in principle, wanted to say, there were many paths which Claudio said the social engagement, educational stuff, programming, being innovative, and always looking forward and always to break the ceiling. And I think that's what we have to remember and we always have to reflect that when taking decisions and finding answers to the many, many questions we have at, at present also due to Corona, but I think we should have also started to answer some questions much beforehand to not be in a passive situation and getting really proactive in many aspects. Maybe that's it for now. Okay. Grazie. Grazie a Dea Zichman, che ha già miscolato un po'. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. She has already coped with a number of topics that we will deep dive further on this afternoon. So thank you so much for the, uh, for this first. A, uh, for the first portion that you share with us and then of course later on in the afternoon we'll try to delve further uh, perhaps also trying to find what are the best ideas on how to carry on in the future and now around this topic that we've just introduced so how to renovate how to renew our music life i would be very curious to hear from emmanuel andre because he has gained this very significant experience in a city like paris which is a not only a, a big cultural capital city of course but it is also a metropolis and it is a city that it is now experiencing a multicultural and a multi-ethnicity based city. Our cities are transforming themselves profoundly uh, when it comes also to the audience uh, that we are welcoming. So the relationship also between our Western culture, European culture, um, that we're very proud of, of course, but it is gradually more evident that our Western tradition now is being immersed in a polycentric world, in a much bigger world, in a much broader world, multifaceted. And we have to cope also with this issue on how to allow, how to allow this uh, uh, different dialogue, different conversations with different cultures and traditions uh, existing throughout the world, but now more and more that we come across in our series as well. So on the basis uh, of a, of a 
this uh, of this interpretation uh, that we are now giving of a of a brand new cultural reality so what are the answers what are the responses also perhaps based on on his experience of what has been done in paris so what are the responses that we may provide to these new cultural needs that are now being requested by today's society good evening good afternoon thank you for inviting me um, the question you ask um, means a lot for uh, the connection between Claudio Abado and Paris, in fact. That means um, if I'm here today, it's also to, to pay a tribute to what he brought to Paris and perhaps a, a part of the misunderstanding uh, of Claudio Abado in Paris. Because um, before the Cité de la Musique, which was the new venue uh, at that time, the, the opening of the Cité de la Musique, it was the Pierre Boulez uh, concept of a new place. Uh, it was the François Mitterrand um, new area of the Beaubourg to think differently the culture. Um, the, the, the opening was in 1995. And at that moment, it meant a lot for Paris to put the excellence of culture, but not in the center of a city, but as uh, Renzo Piano said, close to the suburbs. It was at, the, at that time the suburbs, the northeast of Paris, something empty for the popular people. And to put the best musicians and the modernity in that limit of Paris meant a lot at that time. And Claudio Abado was very connected to these challenges as I understood clearly from the Bologna project, from the Aquila and whatever, all these projects trying to, to uh, conceive um, a balance between two extremes, the, this excellence of culture and the new audience, the future, and the poor area, areas. Um, before the Cité de la Musique, Abado came in Paris, but in the usual and traditional Salle Pleyel and Théâtre des Champs-Élysées. And at that time, he was more appreciated for being um, uh, a great conductor, but a very traditional conductor, not um, an icon of modernity. Um, I think we didn't realize in Paris at that time that it was, he was such a personality, um, a vision of modernity at that time. That's why I'm talking about um, misunderstanding, and not really knowing just a part of Abado in Paris. We knew him better at the Philharmonie because then he came and did with uh, Bollini, with uh, Pierre Boulez, of course, the real Abado project with the new uh, orchestras, with the, the, the contemporary music, whatever. We thought that we were connected at that time. And for the Philharmonie, uh, which opened in uh, 2015, I remember, and that's probably the reason I'm here, I want to never to forget, uh, he called us in send us a letter in 2013 when we announced officially the opening. He wrote us and said, not to the general director, but to the team, to us, to the production team, to the artistic people, I want to come. I want to conduct a concert for free. I want to be with you. And I have to say, it's the only time I've seen someone offering a concert. Uh, for free. That meant that we were um, supporting the same values, the same uh, vision of future. What you said, uh, listening to the future. We were trying to build something risky because the Philharmonie was risky, uh, too expensive. The same question, why do you close Salle Pleyel in the west of Paris, uh, Paris in the rich area? Why do you uh, put the best musicians on the, on the suburbs. Uh, do these people like great music? Uh, these questions were very um, negative at that time. But Abado um, felt that he wanted to be with us. And he couldn't, of course, um, came to see the Philharmonie. Um, and Pierre Boulez also passed away just before. So, I deeply feel that we have a piece of him, even if he was not at the Philharmonie, um, like Pierre Boulez. And as um, Renzo Piano said, um, 
we, we, are all, we have all a piece of uh, his soul, his spirit, his values, and I feel like this, even if I didn't know him so well, I probably the, uh, the one who knew him the less in this room, but I, I don't care because I have the spiritual heritage of Abado because uh, he gave us a lot and I think he's still giving a loss, a lot because of his spirit. Um, the second aspect is about um, modernity. If I, yeah, I'm not too long. No, no, no thank you. Modernity and uh, new vision, new future um, was a bit strange when you consider Abado an iconic artist uh, for that, because we also had Pierre Boulez. And both of them were really different. Um, and I would say we knew Abado through Pierre Boulez, and sometimes uh, with a kind of filter. And they had some uh, common points, of course, but they also have, for the modernity, some very essential differences between both. The first was uh, the writings, the speech, the thoughts about uh, conceptual modernity. Pierre Boulez wrote a lot, was really fighting a lot, but visibly fighting, and Abado was acting more than talking, uh, writing, and being a polemist. Um, for the French people, that means we, we didn't really know what Abado had in mind when he was acting, because we were missing words, in a way. Uh, the second thing is um, that Pierre Boulez disconnected modernity and political uh, commitment. Um, Abado and some others connected both in another way. The, the, the Communist Party was more humanistic, but was still a Communist Party. Boulez took distance with that immediately and was never connected to any party, any political uh, commitment. And for France, to disconnect the avant-garde from the political field was very important and probably make, make a distance with Abadou. Pierre Boulez was also uh, far from the historical uh, performance, the historically performed uh, interpretation. Arnoncourt, for example, um, judging that it was just the past, it was the tabula rasa uh, theory, so we forgot the past. Abadou was I would say more modern with that, because uh, he tried to see in the past what could be modern. And Boulez did that also, but in another way, not with the instruments, not with the, the scores or the organology, but through the domain musical, through programmation. And at the end, I think they were connected. In a way, they, they selected both of them um, in the history of music, what was the history of modernity. And at the end, Boulez said, uh, now we have, after the history of modernity, we have the classical masters of the 20th century. And no doubt, even if Abado is not a composer, he belongs to these uh, masters of modernity of the 10, 20th century. Now, if we compare both of them um, as conductors, um, we always have a, a, a big discussion about analytic way of conducting when we consider modernity and Pierre Boulez as a conductor. And the critics, the audience in Paris and the avant-garde field, when they listen and see Abado conducting, were not interpreting and understanding him as a modern um, conductor because it was not enough analytical. Also compared to Maurizio Pollini, which was also supposed to be very, very analytical. And in a, a bit objective, losing feelings of, you, you know, this uh, cliché and these uh, discussions. Another thing which separated both of them was the um, concept of purity um, attached to Pierre Boulez. Modern art, contemporary art, uh, avant-garde was a matter of being pure, abstract, score, concept. And Claudio Abado was more about global, uh, we were talking about beauty, something we didn't distinguish clearly 
um, the piece of art and the human uh, exception, the human universe. Um, also the connection between an artist, a composer, and the audience, the people, the society. Boulez thought that avant-garde meant to cut, to have a, a distance, to be free as an artist, but also to be a bit far from the world. Um, and the Italian version of modernity was global. When you look at uh, Renzo Piano said, uh, Claudio Abado, but also Maurizio Polini, they, they are all looking for something global, connected. Um, so, in a way, Abado was more, um, was too traditional for the modern avant-garde in France, and too modern for the <laughs> tradition uh, audience and critics in Paris. So, that's why I, I think we missed a, a big part of Abado in Paris and probably the understanding of the, the personality. Um, of course, they have some common points between Boulez and Abado. Like uh, we said, modernity, they are both architects, architects of uh, institutions, youth orchestras, um, venues. It's amazing how they dreamed of new spaces for music, but also of cultural places, human and social places, not only for performing music, but also for thinking music. And that's amazing to see how now in Europe, how many of these venues you have. The last is probably the Boulez Salle in, uh, in Berlin, uh, which has a very nice slogan, um, the music for, for the thinking ears. Uh, I love that concept, but it's in a way the theme uh, with the Cité de la Musique and the dream of Bologna, the dream of Aquila and the youth orchestras Abado created. They both have, um, uh, as I remember yesterday, the philosophy of insatisfaction, uh, of uh, uh, fragility of things. What um, Pierre Boulez called the work in progress, never fix, if you fix, you're dead. Uh, you have no future if you fix, just feel that music, composition, art is flexible, has to be fragile and to get access to something better later. Um, that's it, I feel I'm a bit long, but um, no. just to sum up, no, no, um, it's okay. It's okay. to prepare the speech today, I did something strange. I read all the articles about Claudio Abado, uh, during the, the 20 years before he passed away. Uh, concerts, um, CDs and whatever in French, just to understand how France understood Claudio Abado. And I have to say I've been very disappointed. Some articles, I remember one uh, a journalist came to Wojciech in, in Vienna. He mentioned the staging, the singers, the orchestra, but not the conductor. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Uh, and we have very few interviews, probably two in French. And one is very bad, the journalist asks bad questions and the others are, are very rude. And <laughs> so it's clearly the story of a misunderstanding. And the second interview for Le Monde, uh, or the Figaro, um, is clever, respectful, exactly the common spirit of the, the maestro. Um, of course, the French journalists and the French critics love the same thing. Um, phrasing, breathing, uh, harmony, warmness of the orchestra. Um, the fact that he was a human and a very nice human person with the young people, that was something very touched. And clearly, when he was ill after his cancer, he became immediately a myth for the press, and they changed totally their mind um, to consider him as a hero, as a, um, how do you say, surhom in English? Uh, super warm. Robert mentioned? Super warm. Su su super warm. <laughs> um, very, of course, it was a reality because he was out of the world, but really into the world with the people, and, but really intimidating people in the same time. And every concert was something, as uh, Piano said, magical, because 
It was unique moments. Every concert was like this, but unpredictable. Nothing could be predicted uh, during these concerts. And Paris understood at the very end this kind of uh, vision of somewhere else. So um, I think uh, I have to say to just to stop now. Uh, thank you, Maestro. Um, thank you very much. Grazie, grazie a Manuel André. Uh, well, thank you, thank you to Emmanuel André, and then afterwards, afterwards, I will ask you the same question I asked you before, so that you will give me an answer on the second point that I had asked you. But it's also very interesting to see how different the perception of Claudio Abbado was and used to be in French culture, also because you had to come to terms with Boulez, who was, as you said, the filter in order to interpret Claudio Abbado as well. Both were great conductors and therefore this is a moment as well of, re of uh, reflection and thinking about what both colleagues and rivals uh, did but this uh, is a very interesting conversation uh, many times both this morning uh, today this afternoon and yesterday in our conversation the point of the deep connection that Claudio Abado used to have with the Venezuelan experience with Antonio Abreu, El Sistema, and all this world around uh, this idea, this vision of cultural policy through music that Abreu was able to make successful in a country like Venezuela. And Maria Maino uh, has a deep knowledge about, uh, about it all, and uh, uh, she brought it also into Europe, of course, with differences, and she'll tell us more about it. The situation that we have here is no comparison with what you have there, but the background idea is to educate young people uh, to music through music, and this is the basic idea, uh, which is basic to the project uh, by Abreu and Abado as well. So, Maria, first of all, I'd like to ask you whether you can tell us a little bit more about this El Sistema in Venezuela by Abreu, because we hear people talking in bits and pieces about it, uh, and uh, maybe we're not really so knowledgeable about uh, uh, the El Sistema and this particular project, uh, which uh, is uh, truly still there, continues and grows and grows, as I said. And this is the decisive point. In actuality, yes, uh, I would like uh, to tell uh, the story as I told uh, Claudio about it, because we were very lucky ten years ago with Milano Musica and the Teatro alla Scala, we launched uh, the El Sistema in Italy uh, with this word building, building with music. Renzo Piano mentioned it a number of times. And Claudio had the great generosity of uh, telling us directly what it meant. So it's a rather long video. I just want to show you a bit of it, but you can watch it on the website of Milano Musica. And we really got into it uh, very much in depth because um, it all began as a collection of instruments. Please, let's watch this video. This is just three minutes. Uh, uh, the total video is seven minutes, but this is the essential. What uh, uh, Antonio Abreu did in Venezuela is unique, it's special, and uh, you have to be greatly uh, admired, and you have to look at it with great admiration. Antonio created from scratch, with just a bunch of friends, a system whereby all young people, independently from age and uh, limitations, uh, 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 
can play music. This is also a social system. Even if you're very poor, you can have the chance of studying music. And uh, he gave all of them uh, instruments free of charge. And uh, he found a way uh, that some producers, either Japanese or from Venezuela, uh, um, and uh, producing these new instruments, and so also small uh, violins or, um, uh, you know, kids can begin when they're very, very young. I remember I was there with the Simon Bolivar Orchestra. There was a trumpet, which was fantastic. And I had to, uh, he had to play one note because he, it was the only note he could play. But he did it, and it was exceptional. It was beautiful. The concentration, the excitement, so the love for music, and Antonio was able to have 300 and now 400,000 uh, young people, and he wants to get to 1 million. So, come on, that in Italy we haven't as yet anything like they did in Venezuela is very, very bad and very serious, uh, because Italy is a country country of great culture, but uh, given that we are in contact with some regional authorities, it's a good beginning. Instruments besides musical energy and the uh, proneness uh, to play music, uh, instruments are uh, raw materials in order to carry out a Sistema project. So in several European cities and in Milan as well, and this example is going to be followed by other cities in Italy, we will uh, collect instruments. Well, think about how many families do have at home some old instrument they don't use. I'm not saying that they have to donate it, but just lend it for a certain period of time. Give these instruments to those young people who need them to play. Either they donate them and it's very good, or they just lend them for a certain time span. Um, what would you uh, would you say about uh, what happened there? Well, there there are producers of uh, mm, uh, of uh, instruments who are helping him. They build up small violins, for instance, for very very young kids. And when they're three, they're four, they start playing. But uh, we need a total collaboration uh, from the whole from from the country, you know. So when Oreste, uh, Oreste Bossini asked me a, a very quick overview around the cardinal point, so is this a social, is this a music, is this a cultural, artistic project? Uh, uh, well, what, what is the difference between being accessible and being excellent? So, well, if he hadn't been excellent, uh, Claudio Barro would not not be gotten interested into it. So, of course, uh, as Abreu said, uh, was supposed to be 100% of the four cardinal points. And we wonder every single day, how do we do? How are we carry on? And actually taking the relay as, as we look forward as we look what's coming next uh, and also considering uh, this uh, this this legacy from uh, from uh, Claudio Abado so uh, recently uh, Fiero Parulli 100 um, 100 years anniversary uh, was was uh, celebrated and that and that was the occasion for us uh, to very much uh, uh, challenge ourselves on that. So we do know what are the milestones of the Sistema, which is what I showed you in the cardinal point slide. There are additional bullet points uh, here, and uh, that has to do about what neuroscience is now saying uh, in terms of the well-being that music education can deliver to people and to children. Claudio had a very clear idea around the around the Italian overview. Um, 
uh, in terms of uh, music uh, uh, education. And so he had in mind himself a new way to disseminate the Sistema on a regional basis. Uh, so not to, not to be from a centralized, let's say, to have a, a unique center in the country, which is the case of Venezuela, uh, because they, they do have a very long lasting tradition uh, back, back then now. Um, so we have considered in Italy to work on a regional uh, level. And, um, and there are so many ways that actually we can go through. So we have considered schools, uh, music schools, conservatories, of course, uh, social centers uh, and uh, rehab centers, because also music uh, can allow an improvement in cognitive abilities as well as motor capabilities. So many challenges and hopes I have summarized in bullet points. And of course, you'll be getting the chance perhaps to, to go more in depth later on. But I just would like to emphasize a few of them. So I'd love to say how important the alliance amongst musicians has been, because Abado never traveled to Venezuela by himself. He was traveling with his friends and uh, with other people as well, such as uh, Senese, Brunello, and uh, Pellegrini. And uh, all of these people, they are now kind of disciples uh, from Abado and bringing this uh, social commitment forward. Uh, so as Oreste was uh, anticipating, as Abreu used to say already, well, it is essential that uh, Sistema goes uh, through a strategy, and uh, such a strategy has to be localized, has to be adjusted to every geography, to every city, to every neighborhood in every city. So it has to kind of be translated, if you will, and then adopted accordingly. And uh, Sistema Europe, uh, which is perhaps something that we will go back in a moment as well, well, let's say envisages uh, uh, this this very uh, objective. So right now there are 70 projects throughout throughout the, throughout the continent. So envisages to actually develop potential uh, music potential in all children, irrespective of their age, as we said. And we want to grow the awareness. And it is a permanent change, you know. Once the child or the teenage understands that they love their language, the music language, even if they give up music, making music, well, the change has already occurred. Um, I'd love to share a moment of music, as I understand we have less music sharing with respect to the other session, so I'd love to play a small bit now. This is a, literally a fragment of a, the collaboration between Sistema Europe and Sistema Venezuela here in Scala. It's a, two minutes, and if you want to see the sphere in full, it, it is available on YouTube. So the 30 countries there are being represented. Noi li abbiamo avuti a ah, che tempo che fa? Noi li abbiamo avuti a che tempo che fa? Ah. Sono venuti. Awareness is very much the key word. So listening, awareness. This is a booklet that uh, under the permit of Claudio we've devoted to children because we asked children what was their meeting like when they became aware of music. And they all sound so glad and they know music is going to stay with them forever. Music is special. Music allows me to overcome my challenges to my difficulties. And this has been essential during the pandemic. We we run a kind of a survey investigation 
education, which is something that I will be happy to share also later on. So music and beyond music initiatives from Sistema are also devoted to other challenges, not just in looking into us, but also understanding that the world needs peace, needs brotherhood, needs us paying attention to the environment. And these are all initiatives that music and other, so this is a, a parallel initiative uh, that is now going on. Again, the objective, the bottom line is to raise awareness because we need to be able to listen. And something else that we we can definitely uh, further work on, uh, thanks to the teaching of Claudio, is uh, working on the SDGs aspect. Uh, and we started in Sistema Europe, but also Sistema Lombardia. And I guess you've also mentioned the gender gender equality. Well, perhaps you haven't touched base on that too much. Okay, no worries. Well, we, if you take a look at the 17 SDGs, there's no one fully devoted to culture, but actually culture appears to be in many of them, although there's there's no one uh, exclusively devoted to it. And that is exactly what we're trying to work on. So, and now to Chile, about Lestra is back, and we may perhaps carry on on uh, talking on this uh, topic. Music uh, as, a, as, a, as an activity which has a low environmental footprint, and this is something that families and children realize. So taking care of the instruments, for instance, educating we do educate children and um, again considering that anything that we're surrounded by is not to be taken for granted and uh, musicians have adopted the sistema and mario brunello uh, his is has done a great job and he provides a great contribution to the education of these uh, children this is a master class we run in comunità nuova in our center we devoted a full day where actually brunello was not selecting because we do not select talents Talents are self-selecting themselves. So we do welcome and accept anybody who wants a, who wants to play music. And actually, he's allowing his sellers to be played. Exactly. Well, we do actually happen to need a new seller now. Yeah, exactly. You got you got the point. Yeah, you still love the seller. And uh, and uh, and now I'm I'm about to draw my conclusions. Uh, um, Something else uh, that I uh, very much would love to emphasize out of uh, about those messages is uh, how to deep dive into knowledge. So research, knowledge that uh, has to be associated to music practice, music playing, and music education altogether. So we do collaborate with academia, universities, and anybody who is uh, willing to kind of measure the impact uh, of culture. And this is something that is fairly difficult for musicians, you know. It, it's not that we want to measure music, but we want to be able to measure the ability to support it, to uh, to allow this to happen. And that, of course, uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, allows us also to unleash some of the funding that we will be grateful to receive. Uh, this is a survey we run with uh, universities. The blue bars are showing what happened during the pandemic. So these are all the positive consequences when children were actually growing their abilities, awareness music, they felt that they could speak about music with their, with their peers, for instance. And so huge. Uh, there's a lot of uh, sensitiveness here because people understood how music can be important for them. In Venezuela, we already mentioned that. Um, so Abreu and Abado, well, they work together. We know how are they struggling in Venezuela still today. But actually, let me say that over the past two weeks, there has been the first worldwide conference of Sistema. It's been an online conference, of course, and uh, we could share with any possible country worldwide, what are the priorities of the Sistema? What are what are the items that we're actually struggling with when it comes to support such an activity that has no boundaries? And that was a very key aspect for Abado. He didn't want to, to have any boundaries. And uh, often uh, we did speak through that with him because he would often uh, supervise what was going on in, uh, in Italy from a Sistema 
STEMA standpoint, well, what we struggle with is actually to group together many different and diversified approaches. You know, this, these people, they may look at it like that, and there might be a different perspective elsewhere. But there are two key principles that we should abide by. Let's not start from the base. What we actually need is, a, is an engine. And after you get the engine, you just accept and welcome all of the children who are welcoming this, uh, this aspect, this thinking, and trying to start from top and actually uh, start from the bottom at the same time and slowly they will they will meet one another and then have these children play together and Claudio used to emphasize that because play is playing an instrument and playing with toys and uh, so this is the very essence of the Sistema and that is exactly what we want to keep a building together and we're truly grateful to, to those who are supporting us. Uh, recently, it happened that a person very close to music, well, he knew what we were doing, was donating a flat in the same building where Claudia Bardo was living in Milan. And this was uh, celebrating our 10 years of uh, song, along with other gifts and donations that we got. This is definitely one of the best message for hope and determination in carrying on. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I have to say that this uh, perfectly fits into what has been said this morning. We have discovered that in Hungarian, uh, they also say uh, play. It's only Italian, the only language that requires two verbs to say the same thing. Anyway, we should come back on these topics. And uh, I want to ask you a number of other questions, maybe taking your hat off from the system, but uh, <laughs> questions uh, to be addressed uh, to a musical expert m much inside of the musical life of Italy. But there is something else to be said, also because uh, the Teatro alla Scala is hosting us. And as we were saying before, Claudio Abado is a great artist uh, and always had a European uh, thought. Uh, he never thought about an, an Italian excellence touring the world. But from scratch, when we sta he studied in Vienna at the end of the 50s, he always always projected himself into a different dimension. His generation after the war had a cultural projection oriented into a different uh, uh, direction. And this is very important to be pinpointed. Uh, when he was here as a musical director and principal conductor at La Scala, an artistic director at the Teatro a La Scala, he was the dominus of the musical life at the Teatro a La Scala. He wanted to bring a piece of Vienna into Milan, into this theater as well. And he wanted to change the work uh, carried out by the orchestra at La Scala, who had always been a very traditional type of approach uh, of a opera house uh, orchestra orientated towards a certain processes, certain uh, approaches to uh, build up uh, specific ways of interpreting. He wanted to make it more open, more modern, more in line with the needs of a great uh, international theatre, uh, not only uh, of a great Italian uh, theatre or European theatre. And he wanted to set up the Philharmonic Orchestra of the Teatro alla Scala, um, getting as a model the bylaws of the Wiener Philharmonica in Vienna. It was a long work. Uh, it required a uh, long work to set it up. Uh, it was a very committing process, uh, also from the artistic point of view. 
because he had to convince, to a certain extent, the old maestros, the old professors at La Scala, that there was a pressing need to change. Whilst uh, within the orchestra at La Scala Theatre, people used to think that certain scores could not be performed. Uh, for instance, if you were um, asking a leading clarinet whether something could be performed by them, uh, it would say no, because this cannot be performed. And this was the type of, uh, uh, so to say, mindset uh, that uh, there was in this theatre before uh, Claudio Abado projected uh, his own ideas. Uh, you're going to celebrate uh, the 40th birthday of the Philharmonic Orchestra. Tell us something about it. Well, first of all, thank you. As Oreste was saying before, I'm really happy to be here as a spokesperson uh, for the orchestra. Uh, the orchestra is a creature uh, by Claudio Abado. And uh, I'm very happy to be here also because I'm pleased uh, to talk about uh, someone uh, that in actuality I met only later on uh, during the last years of his life and uh, uh, years that I studied very carefully. Ever since I joined the Philharmonic Orchestra at La Scala, Claudio Abado is a non-going presence in the uh, work of the orchestra over the past uh, 40 years, 1982-2022. The next season uh, is the season of the 40th birthday of this orchestra and in further tribute to the maestro. Uh, I was watching the title of this particular conference while the other colleagues were speaking, and I think I think we can turn it upside down as well, and it might work as listening to the new Claudio Abado, the future. Uh, one of the fundamental elements uh, of the figure of Claudio Abado was to be able to look ahead in whatever he did in life, trying to constantly find new avenues, and particularly to build these new avenues. As Oreste was pointing out, that's true. I'm sorry my voice is not the best one because I have a cold, and, uh, and it's not COVID. Be quiet and <laughs> don't panic, so to say. But in actuality, um, the uh, setup of uh, La Scala Philharmonica uh, originates well before uh, in the 60s, when Abado was very young and joined uh, uh, the uh, theatre, La, La, La Scala uh, starts uh, with a repertoire um, oriented on multidisciplinarity, uh, symphonic programs where music is the whole idea of music. Let us not forget that in between the 60s and the 80s, Abado brought to La Scala whatever innovation existed in contemporary music, um, combining uh, musical programs where the old and the new coexist. Uh, I researched the archives. In the 70s, you had the three uh, pieces, opera, six Berg, uh, a third concert by Prokofiev, Te Deum by Berlioz, uh, Prometheus uh, by Beethoven and Lulu Suite, or in uh, 76, Mozart uh, uh, concerto by piano in uh, Te Deum by Verdi, Stockhausen, Gruppen. This was the first Italian opening. So you get to the 80s, in which uh, most of this musical repertoire, as well as this symphonic repertoire, was being performed by a prevalently uh, opera-oriented orchestra. At that point, he opens up the door and asks musicians to share uh, his responsibility, and he says to them, the Wiener did it, why you're not doing it as well? So uh, uh, take upon yourself the responsibility of managing this particular facet of the orchestra. This is a, an operatic orchestra uh, whose task was to serve the theatre. Now you have become musicians, orchestra members with a repertoire that can only grow from now on. What's interesting about Abado is also that over and beyond uh, mere celebration, Abado has been a man who's always been um, 
led to look for something else, to look beyond. It's curious that its best friend is an architect, but it's also curious, and I was watching before uh, when Renzo Piano was talking about the experience of three very young guys with a crazy project to build up an arc to the intendant of the Teatro alla Scala and ask him to do that. There are some elements, one young man and other young men. So a propelling uh, uh, force connected to minds uh, who can innovate. They have the skill of innovation. They know the past, but they don't fear the future. And at the same time, uh, there is a society around them allowing for this to happen. This uh, sh little social and cultural revolution takes a shape. And so you have this project with a philharmonic, and he then le uh, le leaves it, uh, you know, uh, leaves the baton, and uh, leaves this baton to the musicians. And the last uh, press conference uh, in presenting this new season, um, some young musicians um, uh, now are at the end of their careers in this theatre, and they said that uh, what was uh, able to do uh, was that a bardo really ignited this sparkle and um, made them believe that this was actually possible. And this had an impact, a remarkable impact, on whatever actions a bardo carried out. Because today, the Philharmonic Orchestra has clearly an important and consolidated structure. The first few tours in the 80s were followed by the arrival of great masters, because around Abado you had a number of the best interpreters, uh, uh, both from Italy and international, but uh, you had great conductors around him. Abado never feared. Uh, uh, others. He never feared to come to terms with colleagues, with artists, to leave the podium to people whom he thought were good to conduct certain works. But even more so, he had around them a number of people with whom he shared ideas and projects and gave them chance to do whatever they wanted to. Because let us not forget that many, many uh, artists, many conductors uh, are, um, so to say, between quotation marks, originated from that particular experience. And they discovered together with him uh, their, their, their way of working. I was listening this morning um, to what Lorenza Borrani was saying, and she was saying exactly the same thing. Let things happen. Uh, well, this is important because this took place uh, at a time when society had uh, indeed uh, more proneness to get percolated by ideas, but was also in a position of putting pieces together. The Philharmonic Orchestra is being originated uh, in the 80s within a public theatre uh, as a private entity, which is managed uh, by the members and totally financed by external private sponsors. And the model is still the same, the unique example, most likely in Italy, uh, with uh, just uh, private money, uh, this entity performs a public function. And this lesson remained in the spirit of this orchestra and in the management of this orchestra, because I believe that today both us and our colleagues are experimenting the same thing uh, in various uh, venues in Europe and all over the world. Uh, we have educational projects. We devoted our attention to social engagement we have set up projects and uh, actions so that uh, young people may be more participative. But I believe that the fundamental element and also about us lesson today, if you have to pick up this baton, is to be able to think how to project us 
into the future. What is our tomorrow? What is the tomorrow of a musical message in a society which is ever changing and uh, transforming itself and acquiring new paradigms, inclusive in those of the ideas connected with uh, difference, multi-ethnicity, inclusiveness, and the uh, coexistence of different worlds. Maybe in this conference there is one thing that lacked, uh, which uh, should have been fundamental, uh, Abado uh, uh, as a uh, man of ecology, the ecologist, uh, the guy who thinks and comes back to Milano to, con to uh, conduct his last concert with the idea of planting some trees in the city because the city needs them. Uh, this is to say that the figure of Abado is a multifaceted one, and uh, it is a 360 degree intellectual. And the reason why uh, he had uh, such a strength and an impact on the development of the I Italian society and here in Milano is his ability of promoting, of uh, uh, indeed uh, mm, having both society and cultural worlds uh, faced uh, with uh, uh, higher and higher limits to overcome. And I shall stop here and then I shall leave the floor to my colleagues. But I believe that the true, the actual strength is that uh, he indeed uh, uh, embodied a new generation, opening up doors to a number of new experiences. And this is what we have to all come to terms with and try to get to a better understanding if we want to know or understand what's the world coming up and what kind of legacy we are going to leave to those who will come after us. Thank you, Marco Terugno. We told many stories, uh, many different components from uh, uh, Claudia Bano's role, his, his life in Milan, his life in Berlin, and we heard about this interesting uh, misunderstanding in, in the French history as well. So uh, now, uh, Georg Koch, uh, I would love to make a general pondering uh, about this uh, European dimension of Claudia Bado that we're trying to get across uh, through all the different fragments of history. So how do we try to provide a global vision? Wow. Mm. I'd, I'd love to access a remote control now, if I may, as I have prepared a small presentation. Well, perhaps. The uh, what Ma Manuel André said uh, helped me understand that there are two different kinds of human beings. Group one is a group of people who has experienced the diaspora and uh, people who have met Abado. And I have been truly lucky that I was part of the second group, uh, group two, who those uh, who have met I met Abado for the first time when I was 15 years old. He was conducting European Community Youth Orchestra. And later on, I met him again when I got to Berlin, where I directed the Berliner Zeitung for 10 years. And uh, largely, those 10 years, uh, well, Abado was there for most of those years. And this is kind of influencing my overall perspective. Uh, OK, so when Oreste asked me to speak through Abado uh, as a European artsman with this European dimension, uh, well, I accepted that right away. And that is because uh, uh, Abado was not a, a, a cultural manager, he was a conductor. Uh, but it can still be useful to take a look at that perspective. Uh, how about digging into that perspective? We've heard that Abado was creating a lot, and uh, he created well beyond just being a, only a conductor, right? 
And if we actually make a, some general consideration, so what would an art manager do or a cultural music manager do? Well, these people, they organize events, a artistic events, concerts, if we're talking through music. He uh, trying resources, is uh, seeking for money, uh, people, when I mean resource, this is what I mean by resources. It may also create structures that allow cultural productions to be to be executed. And uh, he's programming with others, or he's planning to program with others. Now I'm getting mixed with the languages. So, well, it, it would engage artists and also allow young talent to grow. And, uh, and then the last three bullet points, um, uh, more recent roles, if you will, out of a art manager, and 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 that is the uh, well, cultural manager, art manager, uh, is also creating connections with people who are engaged. He engages with, um, for instance, uh, we may call them stakeholders uh, from a politics standpoint, economy from the economy world and so on, is also facilitating meetings and counters and is making possible for participation to take place, fostering participation. Well, lastly, uh, of course, when we say participation, it means a allowing access to social groups and social classes that for many different reasons are not having access. So actually, some of these, well, I would say that Abado did most of it. And um, and well, this small list, this list of bullet points, actually has to do with the organisational work uh, of the art manager. But then, if we take the art manager uh, from a different level, from a, with a different perspective, we may consider the institutional role that they may play, and he actually strikes. Uh, to see how Abado has actually covered uh, higher institutional roles, but actually, meanwhile, it would still be a conductor to the point that uh, to the point that uh, his being in institutions would not jeopardize his, his daily his daily work. So, it may sound as a paradox because actually he wanted to go well beyond. Uh, the boundaries that the institutions would impose. Well, this means to be kind of a summary of what we have uh, spoken through over the last two days. Uh, I apologize for the graphic, but I wanted to summarize everything on a single slide. And I, meanwhile, I wanted to provide a, 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 provide a, a great a, a, an idea of the fullness of a of the fullness say, uh, as well as the the richness of his creative work and actually many many orchestras you may appreciate uh, their festivals that uh, that he was founding and musica realtà i don't know whether it is a structure festival we don't we can't, perhaps we should open a debate on what it really is uh, and there are some additional projects here that were turning uh, into real entities, well, well beyond a single uh, a single concert. Well, if you take Prometeo, that says a lot already. Two orchestras here, uh, they have a they have a narrow next to it, and this is what I would call a spin-off. So, an orchestra stemming, originating from from another orchestra. So orchestra that became independent on the market on a later stage. I'd love to actually uh, explore three different examples because uh, well, I'd love to set the context uh, of, of his efforts. Uh, because uh, what a May knew in an historic, in a specific moment in time in history, it might be actually obsolete or update in a different moment, or else it may be conceived as a mainstream, and a, and it is no longer being considered new, and this can actually uh, become a food for thought for later ponderings and conversation. 
because we've always considered uh, uh, it about doing something new, but new st doesn't stay there forever. You know, so Wien Modern was a, a project coming from Staatsgruppen. It was a an, an interdisciplinary a festival, and what was new there? It was uh, that it was opening up uh, the range of events on top of the traditional concert. And, uh, and it would also include, uh, for instance, visual arts and uh, performing arts and film, video, and so on. And uh, as I said, uh, it was uh, it was beyond uh, the Stats Oper, and then he also opened up other venues uh, that uh, could welcome concert music and cultural events, and that could attract a, let's say, audience uh, that uh, otherwise would have never visited the, the Stats Oper. And this was something that he introduced in Vienna. A, well, a little. Uh, a little later, Gérard Moutet came to Salzburg, and he was starting a very similar project uh, in, a, in a very traditional Austrian place, city. Now, the European size uh, is something that it can clearly be perceived here if you take the list of the composers uh, that he, he, has, uh, he has worked with. And um, so that he has worked with that, uh, and uh, and they and there are, and actually they do account for different European regions uh, here. Uh, but this is a also a principle that he was working by almost uh, throughout his life. Uh, uh, so Italy, Germany, Eastern Europe, and France. And is considering again his European European uh, dimension. So Europe became programmatic, literally. Um, then what was new in Berlin? Let's see. Well, we have spoken a lot around thematic cycles. Uh, that those were very interesting. Uh, they had a clear function. They were grouping uh, uh, lots of people, lots of different, lots of different knowledge. Um, in Berlin, and not only in Berlin, and it was all around the Philharmonie. At the same time, they would open up the Philharmonie, and the, it would broaden also the cultural and ideological context. Because by doing so, actually, they would also create connections with other discourses. And I use the the the, the French meaning of the of the word uh, discourse, and uh, not the Italian one. So discourse means the, the way you speak, the the way you do culture. And Abado, on, under that perspective, was actually able to collect the work of the Philharmonica with a lot that was going on in Berlin. Meanwhile. Whether that was his invention or not, I can't tell. Uh, but, and this has been said already, well, Abado joined Berlin in a, in a, very, in a very special moment as, a, as at, at the same time, uh, the Berlin Wall was falling. And uh, so the, 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 the fall of the wall would meant would mean that the, it, that the city would open up, that Berlin would open to the two sides, one another, and would open to the rest of the world, of course, at the same time. And uh, there was already a very strong uh, culture around, uh, the, uh, around working across disciplines. And, um, and, and and Berlin was very much grouping together different disciplines that would have conversation amongst them. And that was already there. That was already existing. And the Philharmony with Abado uh, made this principle, well, I say adopted that as a key principle for the work of the Philharmonica. And there was also a, an existing network of people working on that. Uh, Ulrich Eckhart, 
who has been for many years a superintendent, superintendent general director of the Fest Pile. And in those years, uh, between Karayan and Abado, he, he was there working as a superintendent of the Berliner Philharmonica. Elma Weingarten would, uh, would switch from Berlin Festspiele, where he was uh, responsible for the music session, and he was actually switching to, uh, to Berlin Philharmonica. So those were those same people who were already engaged in those programs. And actually, Abado uh, made this uh, truly part of a key program for the Berliner. And uh, now it is uh, a broadly recognized and adopted practice, uh, not only in Germany, but in Paris as well. So, um, but actually, programs uh, do change. And uh, for instance, uh, we now have a Wien Modern, and the programs are way different. And this is something that we may even debate about. Uh, so what is it changing from a programming standpoint? But still, that said, let's say that uh, he was no longer the authoritative uh, 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 let's say we were actually dropping out the kind of authoritative conductor represented by Karayan and opening up uh, to a different idea of music uh, and uh, music was becoming uh, an art that would allow a, uh, many different disciplines uh, to converse with one another the Luzern Festival Orchestra that we have a already heard of uh, in the last two days. Well, this is another interesting example. Um, this is an interesting interpretation also of an orchestra. Well, uh, finally, this is an orchestra that is that has been grouped as a happy marriage around uh, his conductor, a group of friends, basically, if you will. Uh, Working, working with, uh, and, and working with the conductor as they were a group of friends, and uh, and this may be understood as a kind of a closure with respect to the orchestra that Abado had founded, or else he had facilitated the founding of earlier on. It is still. Very interesting that all of this work, uh, so decades of efforts in founding orchestras, uh, is rooted in a in a discussion. And that now I don't know whether this was the case in Italy, but it definitely was happening in Germany and Austria. Uh, so um, it, the debate was about the institutional role of an orchestra, meaning is, is the orchestra the music uh, way that, we, that still represents the evolution of society? There has been a decade-long debate around this. And actually, Abado's efforts also step in with many different approaches. Uh, um, and it is a still an open discussion, of course, uh, that uh, that allows many different interpretation also of Abado's work and, under that perspective. Well, I did say that what is new in a moment, then it is no longer new in a different moment. And uh, what what is what is funny is that uh, when Abado came to Berlin. Uh, it, it was a, a, a kind of the fall of, a, of another wall, of a music wall, and uh, he and he was perceived uh, as a uh, such as a uh, new, and uh, there was uh, there was long lot of talking amongst the musicians when he joined. Um, whereas uh, 10, 15 years ago, when Philharmonica founded the Digital Concert Hall, they would still. They would still remember of Karajan, 
who, from a media perspective, uh, he was really uh, forward-looking with respect to the years when he was living. Uh, and of course, uh, that was uh, facilitating the, uh, the establishment of the digital concert hall. And, and I'm sure that this was the case because of the contacts uh, that he had cultivated with Japanese from Sony uh, label. And years later, Phil Monica were able to actually have uh, Sony on board uh, as, a, as a practical sponsor, as a real sponsor for the digital concert hall. So the obsolete, if you will, super traditional Karayan was actually providing brand new inputs. But then when in 2002 Rettel joined, then he was welcomed as new again. And what was that new thing again? And uh, well, apparently, it was it was it was up, outreach educational programs. We heard that Abado very much appreciated this kind of activities, but there's a difference there. The when we say outreach with rattle was no longer associated to the aesthetics of the work of art. It would be irrespective of that, and. Uh, And uh, whereas uh, the music work of art for Abado was the very center of his work, whereas for Rattle, who would promise uh, he would uh, he would uh, he would serve all the food groups, it is not perhaps a very rewarding <laughs> image here. Uh, Rattle had a different idea, indeed, uh, and he, his programs, his ideas in terms of outreach were different. And they were actually focusing on a different aesthetics, way less traditional. Perhaps we should wonder, we should ask the same questions around the uh, uh, cycles of Abado, as they're all thematic cycles uh, associated to uh, time back to 1800. Super interesting, but also very romantic. And here, too, I really don't think that we can uh, exactly uh, restart from what Abado brought about in terms of uh, new ideas, uh, but uh, and I try to open up our conversation here. What would the themes be? Um, can we have these programs or uh, can we not? And I uh, end my presentation with an open question. Thank you very much indeed. Well, uh, you know. Um, the image we have evoked and uh, we just watched is perfect uh, to start a conversation connected with the present and future in organizational sense. Uh, Andrea is a very important uh, presence here within this conversation because the Berliner Philharmonica are really the banner, the symbol of great music globally all over the world. Uh, I mean, it's been many years that here in Italy, and not only here in Italy, but uh, I'd say all the musical institutions in the world have been uh, talking about of how to bring young people into a concert hall. How have these new generations uh, uh, share into the joy of music? So, Madame, I'm asking you, um, is it inevitable to have a hiatus, to have a gap between the orchestra between what we call great music and young people, uh, is it inevitable for young people not to be interested or no longer be able to grasp the beauty of the language of music, in your opinion? And what can we do in order to put these two things together and go forward? I think um, it's a... Uh it, it has to be looked at a bigger picture. I don't think it's about young people only. And I think we have had educational projects now for so many years. 
And I think a lot has been done for young people. And what I see in the Philharmonie special is that we miss a generation 30 to 50. And you know this period in life when, when you get kids and both, both parents are working, so you miss out the experience for 20 years around. So what we're trying to do in Berlin is not only to focus education on, on children and, and the young people because what, what they can do in a city like Berlin, it's huge. I mean, all institutions do educational work. So we really set a focus on um, transmitting the messages to the generation 30 and 50. I think what you said about the theme cycles, I think you're right. In that time, it was very creative, it was new, and I think it was also very condensed, very focused, what, what Abado did. And I think it's anyway a good guiding line to transmit messages to our public. So what we are doing also now in Berlin, for example, we have invented a Biennale, which didn't happen only online <laughs> because of Corona. And there we really try to connect to institutions in whole Berlin. So we really broaden the idea of Claudio, Claudio but um, open it up and we, we work with the Berlinale, for example, with the film festival, with the theater, with the opera. We created a huge vile focus. We will, as a next um, thing in 23, we'll, we do a big focus on Ligeti, but we don't only try to focus on the Philharmonie, but really open up um, on a bigger picture. Why? Because, of course, we want to take all people who are culturally interested, um, connect with the Philharmonie or with the Philharmonica. That's just one, one example. Um, then looking at the age 20 to 40, I would say, we have founded a festival which is happening every two years, um, which is focused on electronic and techno music. And because we realized there's real avant-garde there, and also the, it's sort of the borders are very liquid between contemporary music, between electronic music, between techno music. So I think we have to get out of our box, which we also have in Germany, that you know we are very Darmstadt guided still in Germany. Only the next generation probably can do this jump, but that we have to really open up also our musical view on what, what we are doing, and that's what we are trying to reflect all the time. But I think one, apart from the programming, I think we all try to be creative. Every single orchestra in Berlin with the competition we have, they set themes, they set corporations. I think the biggest challenge is the communication to people. And, and we live in a, in a world where digital expertise, the digital journey is important, the digital communication is extremely important. I mean, with Digital Concert Hall, we have now experience of 12 years. We have a huge community worldwide in Facebook and Instagram. We, we build up the communities. But I think we need to transmit what we are doing on stage to the people, whether they're young or they're 30 or 40. I think we really miss this, this interaction because I think we, we all kind of grown up with Smetana and Stravinsky and Ligeti. We know who they are. But I realized talking to people who are culturally interested, they, they, they don't know how to make their selection. So the important is to find the right channels. And for that, we, are, we need people who have a musicology background, but who understand digital communication. And that's a big, big challenge, because when we try to find people, we don't find anybody on the market, not even in Berlin, and not even as our really very profiled institution. So I think one is a program which you have to do really well. You have to open up, um, do corporations, which also attract people, that they have a good first emotional approach to classical music. But I think the bigger challenge is to do the right communication and to get the people to us. And this also leads to the other thing I was mentioning. That's how you also create lobby work and gain interest. Long answer to the question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Well, then I also ask Emmanuel Andre to tell us something about that. Uh, given your own experience uh, in concerts, etc., the problem of young people, uh, how do you tackle this issue? What kind of issues are you dealing with? What are the problems and what are the answers in terms of solving the problem of this young audience and new audience? I don't know if there are even an issue. Uh, the future is important and uh, if we are ready to think to them, to observe, to listen to them and to 
Uh, look at them reacting, dreaming, talking about uh, day and life, uh, history, philosophy, uh, big questions. Then we have the solution. Um, second point, when we talk about young people, I think we forgot the teenagers, the young adults, the students, a, a, a big scale between uh, the really young, uh, the, the kids and the adults. Um, when you build, when you grow yourself, you uh, build your thoughts and your vision of life. And it's a, a fantastic time for understanding uh, the world, uh, to make philosophy without phys philosophical words and tools. And perhaps it, if we put the music in that process, then we have a chance to connect them to music. If you promote a, a Brahms cycle, I think it's, you cannot, uh, because you will be appealed and um, if you are educated, then you will go, you will attend these concerts. If you go to Prometeo, no, no, um, if you know what is the, the kind of experience already know of, you have people around you knowing that, but it's not a matter of communication, it's a matter of concept. If you build something, for example, with Prometeo and about silence, then silence means something for everyone. Not only the musicians, not only those who, belong, uh, do, who, who have the culture already. And then why not around Prometeo, for example, having some other experience of sound and the limit of sound and uh, spaces, immersive or not, um, with a, yes, a physical experience of silence noise, music, uh, time, volume, uh, immersive. So I think the themes are really the key um, because it helps to connect music to the other big um, and important uh, disciplines who also ask themselves the same questions in cinema, uh, paintings, dance, uh, philosophy, history, aesthetic, uh, whatever. If you put um, one of these concepts, including music, but being connected to those uh, who can be connected with music, then you are focused on the challenge which connect music to the world, not only focused on music and waiting the people to come to the music, but um, connect music with the, the, the people with making sense with them. And the most difficult thing to do is to also convince the musician to do that because they want to play Brahms, they want to play Scriabin, they want to, to play the best as they can, and they sometimes don't want to leave their, not comfort, but uh, excellency and um, proudness of tradition. And to understand together that it's a kind of experience also to, to see are you read, ready or able to um, find a way to um, let understand why Brahms makes sense today and what kind of sense. And that's a very difficult question. But if we start with that, then I think not the young people, but the people, uh, young or not young, can be connected. And what about the, the visual dimension? Have you experimented something about uh, the connection between visual and music? Yes, yes, a lot, um, but not necessarily. We also experimented music in the complete dark. But you know, a total dark, without even a light. So you're like in, the, in your mother. <laughs> and we have no experience of listening to a full evening in a to total dark. We have never tried that. So at the end, um, the thing is not to be, I think, to, to be too artificial or to have a, uh, promote a, a superficial experience. The, the point is to find an, a very intimate experience uh, that you can share and that changes your life. A, a good experience changes your life. The bad, you forgot it in the best uh, case. But, there are some experience, some physical sound experience you, you will never forget. 
Um, and then it's not a matter of aesthetic, history, culture. It's just something in you. But uh, Maria, when you said, uh, when you showed uh, the system at concerts, it's uh, also a physical experience. And it's a cultural experience. And it's not, OK, uh, what is the concept? For each of our concepts, can we, are we ready to put a word on it and to see how this word can connect? It's a, um, in a way, being a programmer, but also a dramaturg. You see? Uh, concerts, opera, performance, uh, it's about sense and experience. I think experience is a very important word. Thank you. Uh, Andrea Zipman, what, what about... Eh, Andrea, uh, che cosa significa programmare la nuova musica? Nuovi, uh, com... What are you doing about? I think that the important thing is to find the right... For the, the tradition, also like an orchestra with Berlin Philharmonic, we need to work on the key repertoire. We need to do our Brahms and Mozart, Beethoven, Strauss and Mahler. It's, it's, that's the culture of the orchestra. But of course, we always look apart what, how to develop the music history. This is our duty as well. So of course, we give commissions every season. Also in the Corona season, we had a huge focus on female composers, looking at diversity, of course, but because there's so many great female composers out there. So from the young generation to the old generation. So for us, it's sort of normal to, to have that as part of, yeah, of, the, of the culture being on stage. I, I don't think that really the orchestra is there against opening up the repertoire. I think it has to be set in the right context, also in the probably um, right percentage, also for the audience. I mean, you have to challenge them, you have to be courageous, but still, you know, the program has to, to make a lot of sense. But we feel, I mean, we are a locomotive, as you said, and we are responsible for the music development, music history, so new commissions are important. Second, what we are now also focusing on, you see that you get press, if you, get, if you do a new commission, you don't get so much press if you repeat a really important modern piece they're not played anymore. So we have been looking at the history of the Berlin Philharmonic, we have been looking at the history of fantastic pieces which have not been done anymore, and that's what Petrenko is also doing. He, for example, even in the, in the Romantic era, he has a focus on Zuck, he, he will do the Korngold Symphony, there are many compositions which are extremely interesting and also important for the, for the, for the musical development which have not been played. So I think it's a bit of a, of a mix and not to be set in, in only a corner. Yeah. Before I leave the floor to Klaus, Gorga, I would invite the people here, perhaps, uh, to uh, to submit questions. I'd love to devote the very last moment of this of this event of this conference uh, to potential questions being raised by the audience. Whilst Klaus Kort will now uh, will now answer to my question. Uh, uh, as said, it's very interesting. So we have to, we have to, but actually, what is happening? That, that would be my question, but f f um, maybe <laughs> one of my questions. Then, um, after my experience at the, uh, at the newspaper, I, uh, I passed into the services of a German uh, regional government of a, of a land called Lower Saxony uh, with the extension about the extension of Austria or Switzerland. And the project, I was asked, so the government wanted to modernize the whole musical, musical sector, festivals, institutions, and uh, create new approaches to the public, a new strategic communication. All, so, a big, a huge modernization project, and we did lots of things. So there were musical classes in schools uh, introduced. Many, many uh, elementary school classes started to, to make music together. Uh, we implemented uh, a countrywide um, musical mediation, Musikvermittlungsscheme, uh, 
what, uh, what Rattle earlier had introduced to the Berlin Philharmonic so in the whole countries um, with uh, courses and permanent education for uh, musical managers and, and mediators, people mediating music. We, um, we implemented lots of very, very interesting uh, projects that involved uh, audiences in a, in a new way. So we could say that's new. The question is what, what this changed. Um, positively, it changed uh, the approach to musical or cultural experience for many people, kids, but also families, older people. Um, did it solve the, uh, the, uh, the questions or maybe the problems of the older institutions? I would say no. It just added one more aspect, or a few more aspects to musical life, very positive ones, um, but the, the problems were, or the questions where we, where we started here, or which we are discussing here, weren't really touched. So, um, no youth would uh, reflect uh, his or her personal feelings in a, in a symphony of Brahms. And, Yes, um, the, and also new works. I'm, I'm not sure whether, uh, whether the history of music still exists. So, um, ma managers of concert houses, also the European Union of Concert Houses, they say we have also to, uh, to develop further um, the history of music, to, to commission new works. I'm not so sure whether, whether this exists or whether this is just an academic uh, exercise for a certain type of, of traditional music. Okay. So, yes. So I would rather uh, <laughs> instigate to, to ask what's, what's really changing, not just talk about uh, very intelligent projects. Grazie. C'è qualche domanda? C'è qualche intervento dal pubblico? Are there questions or comments from the audience? We're, we're leaving a leaving few more minutes to, to think about your question. So let me, ask, let me ask Maria. So the way we approach music, but well, because it is, a, it is a truly essential for us, of course. Well, when it, when, because uh, I have been a music organization for 15 years uh, and after dealing with cantate from, uh, from Bach, so having dealt with a, a, a very unique uh, corpus, uh, uh, I, I would say kind of a work that is it's very difficult uh, to get kind of paralleled. Um, Actually, what we have verified is that bringing music to families through kids actually uh, make makes families uh, closer to music uh, uh, through the children and that that's very interesting also uh, there has been the need to overcome the language barrier so that you may play and play an instrument play with toys and play with instrument plays an instrument all at the same time and uh, and and that of course uh, uh, we leave it then to the family to very much select the best programs the most quality programs but that is also so a kind of a Trojan horse, uh, if you will, because if the child can make it, then the grown-up uh, can also make it. It is just a new language. It is a non-selective language. It is perhaps the more universal language. It is the very first one that you're able to perceive, that you're able to perceive it through your ears. So the sooner, yes, the sooner we start, the better. But also paying attention to the quality of repertoire. Absolutely, that's important. We heard the last, the, the, the latest part of the Fifth Symphony of Beethoven, or even Mozart. You know, Mozart is perhaps the most well known uh, uh, composer ever, musician ever. So, of course, uh, music uh, is the art that we can all access, that is most affordable to everybody. And actually, for some people, so many people believe they are torn deaf. And, and that's not true. They find out uh, they, they can sing, many of them. And uh, so actually, how about relaunching all of this? Because now we're all eager to spend the time together back again. And that is something that we missed and lost during the pandemic. Also, 
voice and singing is a, is, a, is a voice, is an instrument that we all have and it costs nothing. And you can also learn to speak a different language, you know. So let me ask the audience once again if there's a question. Eva, Eva Maria Tomasi has a question. Grazie. La mia domanda. Thank you. I have a question. How can we uh, how can we get classical music closer to politicians? <laughs> <laughs> no way. Unanswered question. <laughs> non abbiamo la risposta, non l'abbiamo ancora trovata. No, but I would say I think it's it's really daily work. You have to, to connect with people, have to communicate. I was telling our foundation recently, our board members, we have to have only one person in our institution who doesn't do anything else than political lobby work. <laughs> and I think we all missed out in every single cultural institution to really, you know, work for our interests. I think we have been really bad doing this all over Europe. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's, it's really important because you have to speak to the different parties. Our political life is getting much more complicated now. In Germany, for example, you had maybe two parties. You had to focus on your political work. You now you have four. And then you have extreme rights and lefts, and so you have to have the, the broad picture. And I think it's essential for everybody who is leading an institution that you invest resources and energy and convince the people and our stakeholders who, to take the, the important decisions. And what about the new government? In German. We are waiting. We are in the middle of, <laughs> of, of the discussions for a coalition, but we will have three parties, that's for sure. And the good thing about the pandemic, at least for the freelance orchestra, finally people noticed the really difficult situation of, of artists, mm -hmm. of freelancers, of the, the free finance orchestras. So there's now at least some money given into it. But what we are facing now, we all know that the budgets will be cut all over the place. So what we are trying to do now, and that's because this, I think this question is, is crucial, you know, we have to convince the politicians that they don't cut the budgets in the culture, but they also, do, you know, do that equally in, in the other resorts. Yeah, improvement <coughs> budget. Uh, Marco Ferrul. Sì, in realtà volevo ripetere. Well, in actuality, um, I wanted to go back to Abado also on whatever has to do with the audience, you know, because one of his uh, strongest uh, uh, actions was to open up the doors of La Scala and then walk out from La Scala and go to unusual places. Uh, the issue of the audience for classical music in general or uh, learned music or art music is an ongoing theme and if we're still here it's not really a tragedy uh, the age of uh, uh, the people who uh, attend concert halls is indeed higher than other places and other disciplines and here again there are differences I'm thinking about the great development uh, that ballet is having right now now, uh, I'm talking about contemporary dance uh, versus certain age brackets and how much young people are following it right now. Uh, I believe that in one way or another we have to rethink the way we are uh, offering our audience uh, concerts, particularly contemporary music, etc. There are different experiences in different backgrounds and in different situations. In some festivals you may have younger audiences because uh, you know the way they listen to music is different uh, some some uh, places some venues have become some sort of sancta santorums Alex Ross in one of his texts uh, uh, wrote that uh, one thing that startled him was that uh, in all theaters uh, in the world uh, you have uh, slabs with names of great composers and musicians engraved on the facade. This used to have or still has an impact um, on certain people. Right now uh, in our society the way people come to listen to music and uh, the people expect to have a cultural co uh, content is completely different uh, than uh, what we are used to or people have 
taught us to be used to. And this is an also very important issue if we think about a transition. Ababa was thinking about this as well, you know, and uh, before uh, waiting for people to come in. We have done it in many situations, and I'm thinking about uh, what we're doing uh, at the Philharmonic. Uh, one of the points is the difference between our open rehearsals, uh, which we open up to the public, and the uh, concert being played at night. Um, a complex uh, um, layout. Uh, you have volunteering uh, events with a specific goal that is uh, funding a certain project on the territory and at the same time bringing in different members of the audience in a more informal way uh, and I often wonder how people can stand two and a half hours uh, uh, a rehearsal without uh, actually uh, you know uh, going away and young people can do that uh, I mean there are different ways to get an approach to music uh, you you have to understand what about the needs of the people first, and probably this is a question that should be asked uh, or self-asked by all of us, and also hear what are the needs voiced by people and try to find an in-between. This has to do with the younger uh, people who are not aliens, but probably uh, have uh, little standing in a world or in a, um, an environment uh, which is uh, uh, just uh, uh, kind of closed into a box with a jargon that can be understood only by an elite of people, etc. But um, if you think about uh, the artistic production approach and the involvement from the point of view of the way you choose uh, the various offers, etc., this might be a difference in terms of the future. I believe that whoever has uh, a responsibility here uh, and uh, has a role in music um, have anecdotes to tell uh, with politicians. Maria, what about you? Again, talking about Abado and politics, there has been a, an attempt to coordinate domestically El Sistema. Think of Fabris, Michele Dallongaro and Andrea Lucchesini. We brought uh, the National Orchestra of El Sistema to the Senate. And when Renzo Piano was mentioning uh, that, uh, you know, uh, Claudio asked him to build up a theatre in a month, Claudio, who was very vigilant on the program, uh, discovered that 10 minutes before uh, the uh, concert of the El Sistema Orchestra would go live, uh, so we had also the Manos Blancas, that there are going to be a couple of pieces of uh, uh, cinematic score. He phoned me and he said, well, can't you change the program? This is not up to the standard you should do. And I said to him, well, listen, I don't know whether it's possible. We're trying. He, uh, when we then talked to each other, analyzing the way the concept went, etc., whether the concert had uh, an impact on the senators, etc., he never said, I switched off the TV. He said, I listened until till this part of the program and implicitly saying then I switched off my TV set, always with elegance. But apart from the anecdote, bringing music into uh, political spheres is something that can be done. I don't know whether in other um, places you are going to play to the Reichstag, for instance. Have you ever done that? Do you give concert uh, rice? In the rice? Front of the rice dog. <laughs> <laughs> I don't both. We have actually, we have actually yeah. done both. And uh, we have also done a big open air in front of the Brandenburger Tor. But, uh, mm. no, but I mean, the discussion he raised, I think that would probably be a separate discussion. Because I mean, if we're at the dead end in the music history, that was basically the, the question. So maybe the next podium is about this. I strongly believe, you know, you convince with quality, you convince with good messages, and you convince 
getting an emotional first encounter mm. in a concert hall. And that's why I would never say, of course, the question is new music, in which way are we going? And do we need commissions? I would say, of course we need commissions. We have to encourage people and we have to have the wide range of composers who try out things, find their aesthetics. And of course, we don't know what to, will survive. But I mean, it's our mission really to, to work on that. Um, yeah. Yes, the broader question uh, yeah. to me is, so what's new in, in music and how would we define the, uh, what is new in, in music? For a Bardo, uh, uh, mainly for the, or for the, at least for the earlier Bardo, um, there was a clear idea about progress. Um, it was social progress and um, at the same time artistic progress. So what was new was clear and what was new was good and had to, to go on. And um, many of us still have this idea uh, in, our, in our hearts, but uh, maybe it's time to Yes, to move. but Klaus, you are opening a new session of the Congress. Yes, yes. <laughs> why not? We are not time <laughs> tonight. Bene. Siamo veramente arrivati. Now, we've really come to an end. So, if there are no further questions, I'd love to do the closing for this two beautiful day of conference. I would love to thank, very much thank the guests from this last session who came here uh, this afternoon. And we've come to an end uh, of, a, of, a, of a conference that meant a lot of efforts for us. We had to put this off for, for actually two times, twice. It was postponed. So there has been a lot of work and efforts uh, that uh, we, we, we brought forward to organize for sake of this organization. So this very conference has many fathers and many mothers, and you name it. For sure, I'd love to thank the theater, the opera house that is welcoming us, that has welcomed us. They have welcomed the very idea of this conference from minute one. Cecilia Balestra Milano Musica, thank you so much for having supported this idea around uh, of a conference around uh, Claudia Bado ever since we uh, suggested. And the whole of the scientific uh, committee, the Vindictis, uh, Puccini, Cecilia and also Benedetta Scandola. She has been a crucial role in uh, organizing uh, this conference. Uh, uh, we worked very well together. It, it's been a, a, a beautiful work collaboration over the last few months. They have been difficult months also. Uh, it kind of goes without saying. And if I'm allowed to use this expression, uh, we have created a young equip of researchers that we're very proud of and very happy with because of the beautiful outcomes of this conference. So this shows uh, that we've done a good job. There was a great research being done. And for us, from, from the Fondazione, you know, our key goal, our key objective is uh, to provide a continuity uh, to the material legacy from the, uh, from the fund that has been established at the um, State Library in Berlin. And it's been it's been very nice to have this work group in place, and hopefully we will be able to still collaborate under many different uh, different shapes, perhaps, in different shapes and forms. So thank you. Thank you, Massimiliano Macabroni and Elisa Emma, who have worked greatly to organize this, uh, this event. We're very grateful to them. And of course, uh, we are truly grateful to all the people whom that Marco Stroppa thanked this morning, Fonica, streaming, uh, the translators, the simultaneous translators uh, who have had, have made big efforts uh, uh, in order to translate these two days of event. So, so many people to thank. Hopefully, I was able to uh, to uh, to mention them all. Thank you to all of you coming here in person, attending in person, as well as thank you to all of you who were remotely following uh, this conference. It, it was important 
for us to provide a continuity of a cloud about this lesson. And uh, hopefully, this moment, this past two days uh, have uh, raised, hopefully, new curiosity and uh, maybe some brand new research will come ahead. And that was the key goal. Thank you so much.